moment, our fellow geeks, weebs, nerds, and other unfortunates have been fervently waiting for has finally arrived. It's time for TMI Confessionals of the Nerd Confessionals Kind. Of the nerd Confessionals kind. of the Nerd Kind. And now, your host. Jeff Nerfherder Chandler, Jim Kaiju Baker, and Christina Yojimbo Henry. You can continue. And now, let's get on with the show. Here is TMI. I'm leaving this meeting already. <laughs> I'm not even going to be a part Jeff of this. Jeff is like, Jeff is out. He's like, I'm yeah. out. <laughs> Thanks. You dra- You know, my, you chased my wife out of my, bo- oh, excuse me, uh, living room. <laughs> I did? It's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> because all week, I, I'm I did trying personally. to watch. All, yes, great. I'm like, I'm like, play Christina. Don't, don't blame me. I'm just an innocent victim here. Saturday morning, I put it on. She's like, you're watching this now? And I'm like, well, <laughs> would you rather I wait until it's dark out and watch it? Like, I have to watch this. So, I mean, it's not she went. It really matter. scary. It I understand. There's a certain level. My wife does but, not like these type of movies uh-huh. at all. I think she was traumatized as a child. She probably was in someone's basement watching HBO. When and, she was and, 12. and you did probably have an ulterior motive yourself for putting it on during the middle of the day. Was there a security blanket involved as, as well? <laughs> I have a pillow that my cat sleeps on. So, yeah, he's my first line of defense. <laughs> he is my Rex. Let's put it that way. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, look, you sad about the dinosaur. <laughs> we're, we're, all right, folks. Sad about we're Rex. Six. Yeah. So, so welcome, everybody. We are talking yes, the new Scream movie mm-hmm. this week. Scream mm. 6. Hot actually, off the presses. with a numeral behind it this time. Mm. And along with Scream 6, you may have worked it out yourself. But we are talking New Nightmare, which what? is, is a, a little bit mess. misleading since the New Nightmare came out in 1994. So say, it's, it's not, not exactly so new, anymore. new anymore. At the time, it was probably a good idea. Yeah, it was new to me. I've never seen it. And I and I will say that uh, it, it is pretty spot on pairing because mm-hmm. both of their little meta. But we'll get into that. It, um, it's almost like it was like a uh, testing ground for what came the next year from Wes Craven. Yeah, it's like a, it is. It's like a, a, a proto scream almost yeah. down to the sound of the phone ringing and the way people stare in dread at the yeah. phone. Yeah. When it rings. <laughs> Uh, it's also uh, happy Oscars Eve, by the way, tonight are the Oscars or as we want to refer to them as Slapsgiving. Yeah. By the time people listen to this, that'll be old news, like four days. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody will even remember who won the Oscars. No, in four isn't days it amazing from now. How, how big the Oscars were at one point And now it's kind of like, oh, it's this weekend. Uh, like a few reasons for that, though. Right. I mean, like. There's no monoculture every, anymore. Like people don't only have four channels and everybody sits right. down and watch the same th- watches the same things, you know, every night. It used to be like these big special event things. People yeah. would, everyone would tune in, but now people have other things they can do. They don't have to watch the Oscars because it's not the only thing on TV. No, and I think maybe not to get too political that Hollywood is kind of, I, I feel this this elite getting together and everyone, you know, patting each other on the back is not as well. Well, I mean, there there's definitely some bad optics of a bunch of rich people congratulating each other yeah. <laughs> for mm-hmm. the things that they think they've done well this year. Correct. But as, said as, that, if, <laughs> as if they're not rewarded enough. For- Correct. <laughs> what? You only got paid $20 million for that movie and you have 4%. Now we're going to give you a gold statue. <laughs> gold statue. And, and a gift suite. You go in there and you take whatever you want. Yeah. I throw all this artic- stuff at yeah. you. I saw an article about the the swag bag this yeah, year. Yeah. $126,000 is how much it's valued at. Three times the median salary in this country. And it'll probably be dragged home in uh, some uh, Uber car and thrown in a closet somewhere. So anyways, um, having said all that, any hopes? <laughs> <laughs> Having said it's culturally irrelevant. Well, it's relevant to this podcast. 
yeah, I don't want to get into who's going to win or who doesn't win. I just, you know, like, like you, you know, as a movie goer. Mm-hmm. I think that everything at everywhere all at once is going to do really well. And I hope that they do. And I hope it's a signal to Hollywood that you can take chances. Yes. Hopefully it's a signal. Green light, different kinds of projects take chances. You know, people want to see different kinds of movies. That's what I'm, that's what I'm hoping that the prestige conferred by the Oscar will mean that more types of movies will come out. But getting back to the Oscars themselves, I think a big part of the problem is, is that that's a foregone conclusion. By the time the Oscars actually air, who's going to win? Because we all know everything, everywhere, all at once is going to win everything. And everybody knows that because it's won everything up until this point. So it's no longer a surprise. Mm. Yeah, I mean, maybe the Oscar should be at the beginning of the award season maybe. instead of capping the <laughs> award season, right? Yeah. But that's the yeah, whole thing. I... Like once you start mm. looking at, especially when you start looking at the Guild Awards, right? Like everyone uses, the Golden Globes are almost in like a thing of their own because it's like a little group of people who are reporters who vote. Um, like the SAG Awards, they're the largest voting body. The SAG, you know, the Screen Actors Guild is the largest voting body within the Academy. So a lot of people use the SAG Awards as a predictor, you know, the Directors Guild Awards, stuff like that. A lot of times the individual Guild Awards can be a predictor of success at the Oscars because these are all bodies that vote within the Academy. So, yeah, I mean, maybe the Oscars should come first. Maybe, yeah. And <laughs> as you were saying, that the outlier is the Golden globes and Mm -hmm. controversy aside i think that's the only thing that really um gives you surprise results because maybe they're not you know looking at the same criteria as professionals would be and also because they break out their categories differently they break out from musical or comedy versus drama so they're not like there's more opportunities for wins and it's always fun to see what they consider a musical or comedy yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I did see that the Oscars uh, got a, they did away with the fan favorite award, which I think they just started last year. There That's was a fan favorite award. Yeah, there was. And I there was know. some controversy about it because this is yeah, right. it's a little condescending and it's sort of implying that popular film Equals. is yeah. is less important than artistic, quote unquote, artistic film that they choose mm. to honor at the Oscars. I mean. You know, the Oscars used to there used to be films that were big and popular, but also considered artistic achievements. Right. Like Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump made a kajillion Mm. dollars at one best picture. Right. Or a movie like Silence of the Lambs. Silence of the Lambs was popular entertainment, Mm. but it was Lord Lord of the Rings, even though that was a concession to the entire trilogy when that one. Right. Exactly. But now it's like sometime in the last 10, 15 years, the Oscars have decided that like popular film is not artistic film somehow. And I think that's too one of the reasons why a lot of people don't watch the Oscars because a lot of people haven't even seen the movies. They don't even mm. know that's why they don't listen what to they are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So but that's why also I think where they throw in a token box office success like a Top Gun into yeah. your nomination. So maybe people that saw that will tune in. But they've got to do more than that. That fan favorite, by the way, that award was literally a golden token. <laughs> There's no Oscar mm-hmm. statuette. It's just There's like no a round Oscar? coin. This is your token award. All right. Do we have any other news before we get into it? We do, actually. And uh, both of them are going to tie into uh, actors slash potential characters in uh, our at least our our main movie. Okay. Does Beetlejuice 2 that has been rumored to be in development and Michael Keaton's on board and um, Tim Burton is on board. Um, I think Catherine O'Hare has basically come back on. But now rumors are flying that uh, Jenna Ortega is in talks to play Lydia's daughter. Okay. So we still need Winona Ryder to officially jump on board this, but uh, it could be interesting. Um, Mm -hmm. So a requel, as they say. Yeah. Franchise, requel, requel, (laughs) reboot, whatever. (laughs) I don't know. Again, this is, this is a rumor. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stay on top of it, but uh, I I have to say she's uh, very entertaining to watch. So, and I think that she could do justice to uh, yeah. Lydia, yeah, she's, she's got to capitalize while she's the it girl. She's got to capitalize. I know, I know. 
So uh, uh, the other news, which is very interesting, which is we had also spoke about this uh, DC filmed in the can, $40 million, whatever, Batgirl movie. And then it was shelved. Yeah. And they just use it as a tax write off. Well, apparently there were more, more movies. And uh, Christina, this will affect you because one of the movies, Scooby Doo and Crypto 2. What? There's three Scooby Doo movies that were in development or almost finished that have been completely pulled from their schedule, locked in a vault, put away. We're never going to talk about them again. Why? Except <laughs> somebody leaked the, the movie yeah. online. They're scrambling to try and get this stuff removed. So I, again, I guess it looks like it's just a, you know, it's a tax write off. Yeah. You know, they've gone on record. We're not going to spend money. We're not going to, you know, these high budget movies, we're not going to just release on streaming services. So what am I paying for, for second rate movies? Right. Um, but yeah, the, so the Scooby-Doo and Crypto 2 apparently uh, was leaked. It's all over the internet. Uh, they are doing their best to scrub this. But there are two other movies, a uh, sequel to Scoob, which okay. we reviewed. I thought it was um, okay, but yeah. Okay. Was all but completed. And now this is uh, wrapped up tight in a bow and shoved in a closet somewhere. That's dumb. It is I mean, dumb because there, you was, ha- there was already, I mean, they gave the first one a theatrical release during the pandemic. Yeah, no less, during, right? during COVID, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I don't know. But the other one is Scooby-Doo and the Haunted High Rise, which would have brought back the Hex Girls. Oh. <gasps> I know, what? right? <laughs> you can't be toying with us. <laughs> oh, look what we almost did for you. I'm like, what is going on here? But yeah, Matthew Lillard, you know, he's back as, as shaggy. They did their work. I'm assuming they got paid, but now it's... I mean, I this know. is the thing, you know, all the people who were upset, all the Scooby-Doo fans who were upset about Velma because it disrespected the source material. Right, so now and you're like, taking all the source material. So now you're taking the things that people love about Scooby-Doo and you're just locking them away. Yeah, so yeah. Nah, we'll now we'll give them Velma. <laughs> Screw it. They'll be happy with that. No, we weren't. We want Ruby Snacks. So, uh, yeah, so Scooby-Doo is getting a shaft. I'm very upset. I know. And that's my news. Disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can uh, spice this up with some uh, Scream 6 or, talk. Or, yes, yeah, Scream 6. Let's so I can now it. be upset about a different thing? <laughs> oh, wow. You are showing your head really early. Yeah, wow. should we just give buckets now and then move yeah, on to the nightmare? Screw it. Let's not even talk about this. Yeah. The All whole right, episode is just us talking about uh, content. And I, I'm do. feeling like this is Bizarro World right now. <laughs> all um, right. Wait, 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 wait. First of all, trailers. Mm-hmm. Dungeons and Dragons. I've never yes. seen this trailer before, and suddenly I am interested in Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, screw us, Am too. We're, <laughs> we're taking it off the the list. We're gonna Dungeons and Dragons. So the trailer is the guy who does the honest trailers for Scream Junkies. Did you did oh, the no. voiceover? No. Did you recognize his voice? No. Because that was the trailer that we saw. It was him talking over the trailer did that is that what you saw or did you see like a standard trailer no, saw i saw like a, a standard trailer yeah, with yeah, scenes from the movie from the movie is this another the, alamo thing that they're pulling on you okay it definitely was the guy have you seen you've seen the honest trailers right i know, yeah, I know what you're talking about yeah no i don't know what you're talking about when you say honest you, trailers you've never seen that jim no so it's like a YouTube thing. This guy basically does a voiceover for the uh, an existing trailer for a film, and he makes fun of it. It's done by Screen Junkies. They're, some of them are really funny. Oh. Um, yeah, they would never. It's a, they would it's never. MST three K unless uh, they want to shoot themselves in the head. I don't think that that would ever be released. Generally, something like that that makes fun of the product before it's even out. Well, I think the movie's looking to make fun of itself. So, so. the trailer that we saw had this guy's voice over it, and it seemed like it was definitely lightly mocking the film, <laughs> but they well, were using the character- it as a selling point. <laughs> well, I think in the, the trailer I saw, Chris Pine. Yeah, it looks like he's having fun. This looks this looks better than it probably has any right to be. Well, after this show, I'll see if I can find that version okay. of the trailer to send to you guys, and I'll also find an honest trailer to send to Jim so that yeah, you can please, I have no a idea. Subscription to that. You know what yeah. needs an honest trailer is the Transformers trailer that I saw. <laughs> oh, Yet another movie. Beast Wars. Beast Wars. And how many um, is this now? How many is this now? Eighteen. I tried. I don't, I don't watch them. I tried the first one. 
I uh, couldn't tell what was going on. They have gotten better with that. I, I, I've i seen enough of them because I have a younger son who is into them. And listen, I grew up with Transformers. I, I was a little aged out by then, but I still watched the cartoon. I still went to the movies to see the Transformers animated movie in 86 when I was in college. Uh, they do get better as far as that, because, yeah, the first movie, the, the action is, is so blurred and there's so much going on. You don't know what you're looking at. Um, but they're convoluted. It's it's very you just you you know what you're getting into. You go in, you watch two hours of robots beating each other up and humans running. So I did not see the trailer for that. I saw the I Dungeons and Dragons it. trailer. I saw Bo is Afraid, which I've mentioned to you guys that before. One. Yep, we've seen that before, but not, not and um one more thing, which I can't remember offhand. So I can't hmm. remember any. I did get to see the John Wick trailer this time. I did see the yeah. That was it. and you didn't cover your ears. You didn't. No, no, because they don't give away too much. They did show the high table. Well, at least there was a table and it wasn't <laughs> high, which was it disappointing. Was, wait, it wasn't actually high. I don't think I paid attention that much. <laughs> I want a step stool in order to get up to it. And they had uh, Pennywise, if I recognized him correctly. Yes. And Donnie Yen is in it also. Which Pennywise is the in the uh, subways. <laughs> Donnie yeah, Pen- Pennywise. Actually, I see him every day in the grate next to my in my parking lot. <laughs> do you say hey? There? I do. Stand I do. There? But after the trailers, we also get another message like this is a pandemic era message. And I think we're out of this. But yeah, I this got, was a weird. Yeah. Thanks for seeing it in in the theater. I think audiences are coming back. But still, it was nice to be thanked for paying but, your money and I, sitting down. I don't know. Tom, Tom Cruise did the same thing at the beginning of the Maverick. Was your theater pretty full? No, no. no. Ours was, was pretty, pretty empty. I was one thirty on mm. a Saturday. It was the first showing of the day. Yeah, mine was one thirty on a Saturday as well. Just, uh, you know. We saw it together, kind of. Less than 24 hours ago, I saw it. And yeah. mine was maybe 45% full. Oh, yeah. No, I probably had. And let me tell you, people. there was intense mutant BO coming from somebody. <laughs> This so, is why my um, wife won't go back to the movies. <laughs> so wait, you guys saw it at 1.30. So I was seeing it at 12.20 Central Time. Oh, so we're so actually basically. all watching it at the same time. We were synchronized. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I um, realized like all... that I had made a strategic mistake. Because Uh-oh. though I normally love to go to the Alamo, the Alamo Draft House is on Clark Street, half a block south of where Wrigley Field is, which means it's in like a district where there are a lot of bars. And I forgot that yesterday was Parade Day. And Parade Day in Chicago is when the Saint river di- is gets green. dyed green. Yeah, we and there's a fugitive. parade. <laughs> there's a St. Patrick's that, yes, if you've seen the fugitive, you know what this is like. We always just and thought then- <laughs> that that's what it looks like year round. Sorry. <laughs> But that means that every bar in Chicago is um, slammed with 20 somethings starting at around eight o'clock in the morning, traveling in packs. And so for us to get to the Alamo, we had to walk through. There's all these people in the middle of the street. They're drinking. They're smoking weed. So it's like you're walking through a cloud, Mm. like a huge (laughs) cloud (laughs) just to get. Did that enhance your movie experience? (laughs) (laughs) So that like just trying to get into the theater was not fun. And then trying mm. to get home. Get... The gauntlet. <laughs> yeah. But there was nobody dressed as Ghostface. There was nobody dressed as Ghostface. Okay. No, everybody was wearing green. <laughs> so Scream 6 itself. Let's just start this by saying that there will be spoilers. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah, we can't. In talk. this episode. So yeah. and these movies all hinge on the whodunit aspect. So if you want to see this at any point, even if you're going to wait until it's on streaming or wherever, stop listening right now. Unless or, you watch the trailer and you already know who the killer is. So now, now wait I, a second. Let's not yeah. get into this yet. Let's <laughs> not get into this yet. Speaking of yeah. last week. Except that it's not because it's relevant to the way I perceived the film and the way the film played out. What? Yeah. I have to, like, I have to reveal. You're already given a caveat. No, I have to reveal to you guys what my thinking was going into this film. Okay. So let me just hold on. I just want to preface this. So last week you said that you were going to do your homework and watch all the the, the one through five. Yeah. You Mm -hmm. did that. Yeah, of course. Okay. So Mm -hmm. 
you did the same thing the week prior with the John Wicks. And what else did you watch? You watched all the Rocky. Creed. You watch all yeah. the Rocky movies. <laughs> yeah. So did this enhance six or detract from six? So I I think it's the latter. Um, your comment. I think for me that this did not necessarily help this film because it reminded me of how good the other ones were okay and <laughs> you go. see now i watched scream five i mm-hmm. didn't watch all the previous four but i did watch scream five to reacquaint myself with these characters mm-hmm. right and my opinion of five didn't change really from how i felt about it last time but it did help obviously even though it was just a year there were some plot points that i had forgotten about mm-hmm. so so watching that and going into this, I was fully schooled, you know, even though that there's some token things that they throw at you, like, you know, explanatory dialogue, just in case there's audience members that didn't see five. That kind of sums up what happened. Oh, yeah. Her, yes. her boy, you know, mm-hmm. that the, her boyfriend was the killer. But everybody thinks now that she's the one that did it and is framing the boyfriend. So I think it, it does give you a little bit of recapping, but it's helpful. Yeah. It's, it is helpful. Yes, to watch it Scream is. Five. Okay, well, I will say I did not rewatch Scream 5. And at the end of last week's episode, I even said, I don't remember any of these characters. I don't even remember who the killer was, Mm -hmm. but it didn't take me long to remember the twins, uh, you know, Sam. They do go out of their way to kind of like, uh, you know, connect the dots a little bit. So uh, I didn't feel lost by any means. And talking about the twins that you just brought up, because there's a as they call themselves, Core Four the core in this four. movie, which survived from Scream 5, and they're all going to the same college. They all apparently applied to the same place because they can't break up. But um, I was convinced in my memory that Chad had died in Scream 5, but he did not die. Yeah. He is here. He should you have died at the here, end, too. In the- yeah, that's what I was saying. It's like if you blink, you'll miss that scene because you just see him. Hey, I'm alive. And then then they cut to somebody else. I wasn't even sure that it was actually him in the ambulance. I had to rewind it because he's completely bandaged up. I'm like, that could be anybody. I don't know who that is. <laughs> it's just stunt double. Yeah, I'm amazed uh, how many disempowerments are going on. And yet people just continue to survive. In this, and, and let me this tell franchise. you something else. I, I'm not off screen five yet at the end. I don't think I noticed this. Gail gets shot in the yeah. stomach. Yep. Yeah, everybody else is getting carted away in the ambulance. They give her a blanket to sit down yeah. on the curb with. Well, this is the, but the, 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 that's one of the issues with this movie is that these people should be dead. And yet you're completely eviscerated. And yet you're somehow magically crawling across the ladder. Yeah, it seems and without giving without anything away too much. Up ah, front we said here, we're going to spoil this. So if you're already listening, it's the spoiled. stakes are really low because you realize, as Jeff just said, people are getting stabbed left and right, but your core characters, you realize by the end, we're never in danger because none of them die. Some of them take heavy, heavy yeah. hits and heavy stabs, but they're all okay. Multiple at the stabs, end. multiple, like I said, eviscerations. And mm-hmm. yet we're, we're bouncing Except right back. a couple, a couple of peripheral characters do get mm-hmm. it, but your core four and, you know, outer rim characters, don't. So you mentioned this about Chad in five. In six, the same thing happens to Mindy. And yet well, she's running around at the end with a bandage around her waist. Chad, multiple, two. He has, he's uh, Dewey. <laughs> apparently missed all the major organs. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. thought when I first saw Scream 5, I did think Chad was dead because he got um, like his femoral artery got sore and it looked yeah. like <laughs> it was like in scream five he was getting stabbed by bishop from aliens right. <laughs> he's and, one of the core four he can't die but and then he gets you know stabbed again here like really right. badly but he is kind of like dewey who you think at the end of scream two that he's dead because he's really messed up but he's not you know, he survives because of his scar tissue. Yeah, just, is that what happens? <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the scar tissue. I just build up a barrier, a mm-hmm. resistance to being stabbed. <laughs> but so, but it, all the screen movies have to open with a spectacular with kill, a guest, right? With a guest star. With a guest star that you don't see again, obviously, for the rest yep. of the movie. And in this yeah. case, it is uh, one of the, the new generation's scream queens, yeah. Samara Weaving. At first, I thought... 
they got Margot Robbie to be in this movie? <laughs> and like, oh, no, no, no. That's Samara Weaving. Yeah. Right. No, she so was in the Taylor Joy. Ready but, or not. Uh, yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, right. The radio silence yeah. guys. Who, yeah. So, and it's <sighs> a fun scene only because, you know, Ghostface takes his mask off at the end of yes. this. Yeah. And I recognize his voice, that that actor, uh, Tony Revolori, Revolori, who's Flash Thompson in the new Spider-Man movies. And he's also in Willow. Like when he's on the phone with her, because, you know, I've seen enough of these now, but, you know, the setup of the the original movies and you know that it's not going to end well for this girl. So you're waiting to see what kind of twist. And yeah, he kills her. He lures her out. He tells her that she's stupid because she she did the one thing she she teaches a class on slasher films and yet somehow fell victim. You see, this is what the audience is thinking as well. Wait, she should really know better than to do all this stuff. Plus, I don't really see how or why she is going on a blind date or needs to go on. a Right. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Some Tinder. She's uh, a she very busy career woman. I That's think she what has it is. issues. She has some yeah. issues, Jim. She's setting yeah. herself up for disappointment, I think, um, yeah. for, for Reggie. Listen, is... if I was Ghostface, I would have <laughs> taken my mask off and had a drink with her. <laughs> so, but uh, no, this guy, Tony, whatever his name was, I don't even remember what his character's name was. And then you Jason. see him, he just goes, oh, Jason. Jason. His name Jason. is Jason. Oh. <laughs> his <laughs> last that. name is or Carvey. He's... Carvey. Oh, really? Carvey. Uh, and what was his roommate's name? Andy uh, cut her up. Greg, the, room, he, the, the, the roommate, roommate's been I, domered. He's in yeah. the refrigerator. <laughs> I don't like this. They, no... they probably didn't even use an actor to a real person mm-hmm. to base that uh, all those prosthetics on in the refrigerator. Mm-hmm. So I can't say that he was played by anyone <laughs> in particular. His head was in a butter dish, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Not good. That was like Friday the 13th part two, actually, when uh, the, the opening scene of that, when Jason's mother's head is in the refrigerator. Uh, how's he getting warmer when he's... But of course, this is like a, a fake-out beginning because, as everybody has been saying, after Ghostface kills the teacher in the alleyway, Samara Weaving, takes off the mask, and you see it's Flash Thompson uh, under the mask. Damn, Flash. Uh, you know, is this going to be our Ghostface for the rest of the movie? No, no, no. no. The real Ghostface... Real, and I say that with big quotations around it, <laughs> it takes umbrage to what Jason Carvey and his roommate Greg have been doing. Uh, and later on, you find out that he they were in the way. So there's too many killers. There's too many murderers in the pot here that, that are taken away from the glory of the real Ghostface. So uh, Ghostface has to get rid of these wannabes. But you do see the apartment and they are horror movie aficionados. And you see there's a poster for a horror podcast up on the wall. Yeah. Last podcast on the left. I'm like, how'd they manage that? The yeah. that free advertising up there. And you just gave them more advertising. Nice. Yeah, I did. I did. <laughs> yeah. Flash Thompson doesn't survive long yeah. into this movie, unfortunately. No. And I know that as we get into it, uh, it, it is explained where the some of the original ghost face masks are coming from but why is why are you still manufacturing these things this is a real killer that was in the loose in the world and yet you're because they're off it. because there's this is like what's always been a little bit weird right is like because they're actually stab props it's the stab movies movie franchise yeah. right within this fr- this film franchise and then people are making film props, mm. you know, for fans based on the stab movies. Right. So this gets, that's, I mean, I, I know that this whole entire franchise has been very meta from the get go, but this goes that extra step. Also what they would have, what they seem to be setting up at the beginning, which they kind of dash once flash or Jason gets it is that he knows Tara. Because on his way back to his apartment to get killed, yes. he sees Tara going to a costume party. Now, this must take place during multiple Halloweens because yeah, the, the Halloween is like the entire week. Yeah, because they're going to a costume party. And then later on, you see everybody dressed up on the subway. And they never really spell out it's Halloween. It's like free unless it's uh, like I, on a I banner really somewhere. Think it took too much yeah, but you got to work it out for yourself. Wait, is this Groundhog's Day? What, because what people don't, you know, here? I know that the New York City subway is weird and a very bizarre experience in <sighs> itself, but not everybody dresses up on the subway. It's not like an event like that. Well, and usually that all takes place in Greenwich Village. Greenwich mm-hmm. Village, uh, the, the lower Manhattan is like the, the mecca for 
Halloween. And yeah, it's shown later. The school is way up in like Midtown. Oh, I mean, not even Midtown. It's like Uptown. So they filmed the, in uh, Montreal, which and it, is it very doesn't obvious. look like New York. <laughs> it does not look like I actually made a note. I said I lived and worked in Manhattan. This does not feel like Manhattan to me. And then when I realized it was filmed in Montreal, it's like, OK, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. The only time I think you see Manhattan is on an aerial map on the, the FBI computer trying to try to, you know, pin locate the, where the phone call is coming from when she's in the uh, Central Park. Before, Jason, I'm going back to Flash Thompson because but it, it, <laughs> it, figures, keep Flash. it figures into the end of the movie um, as he thinks he's talking to his roommate, Greg, but he's really talking to Ghostface on the phone because there's a voice modulator and he assumes that Greg is testing out the Roger Jackson voice modulator. It's revealed that they were finishing Richie's movie, um, mm-hmm. that that was the point of them doing this, um, which is not unlike what the real motive was of the ghost face killers, because Richie is heavily involved in their um, MO. So Richie looms large and he, <laughs> and Mr. Quaid actually did film um new scenes for this even though he was killed in five but yeah that's enough of my flash thompson he's dead he's killed at the beginning and then you're introduced reintroduced to sam and tara the two sisters and like we said before it's um kind of stated that the internet has painted sam as the killer and that there's conspiracy theorists out there that say that she did all the killing and then she framed her boyfriend, Richie, who has become like a folk hero among these uh, conspiracy theorists online. Yeah. And there's that nice scene with her and the therapist. And he's like, you've been seeing me for six months. You can't give me anything. She's like, all right, I stabbed him 22 times and shot him in the head. How's that for opening mm-hmm. up? All right, we're done here today. So uh, missed opportunity, Jenna Ortega, not dressed as Wednesday Adams <laughs> Halloween party. I didn't see it, but there is somebody dressed as Wednesday. Adams oh, was there the Halloween? Party. Oh, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't see it. Right I read that afterwards. Somebody walks like it, through. Yeah. When you get into the subway scene, like you see like every major uh, horror franchise character, except for Jason. I did not see a Jason. And I'm like, that's a missed opportunity because obviously we have Jason takes Manhattan, which right. would have been a great. But the, again, you're forcing me to talk about Flash Thompson. That's what he's watching in the beginning oh, really yeah oh, yeah yes okay yeah you're right okay i i came home and i wrote my notes and i really thought that i was gonna sit back and let you guys take this because uh i wasn't gonna have much i can i just say did not miss sydney well i mean i do but i don't know where she would have fit in in this film i yeah. think that's well i think that's my point which is yeah. you know we talk about you know like creed where yeah. it's like Rocky it was such a large part. And then it's like, all right, well, now these characters kind of have to live and breathe on their own. And I and I like, you know, Gail coming back into it. Um, she's not a very likable character. And I think that that's uh, obviously she's design, always been that way. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah, I know. But it's Courtney. Mm. Cox. Yeah. You but she's getting a, not like she, Courtney. Cox. She, but she has been more likable. In right. the past couple of um, although she got entries. over Dewey pretty quick. How how many years in between these two movies? Because she already had a boyfriend. Well, no, she was and already like, she was already split with Dewey, though, in the in Scream oh, 5. Oh, so they see, were this already. Is, all right. Well, this, yeah. is, this stuff I don't remember. I just remember them being together. Was it two? So they, they the characters <laughs> were got together at the end of two and okay. three. They broke up again. But at the end of three, he proposed to her. By four, they were married. But by five, they were divorced. Mm-hmm. Just throwing it out there. So, so yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So I need to talk about my feelings going into this because I was really hopeful that something was going to happen in this film. And I want to say that I was really, really disappointed in the day Newmont for multiple reasons. One of which is that it's exactly the same as the end of Scream 2 which I just find infuriating. If you're going to say we're Mm. going off and we're doing our own thing Mm. and we're going to make this series our own, don't have the plot be exactly the same. You mean like the first story last week and Rocky three. So that I just found really, really frustrating. But so I freely admit, and I think I even said this to you guys, my theory was based on two things in the trailer and I didn't have any, like actual plot information. So 
it could have been wrong and that was fine. But I do think the trailer led you to th think certain things. And I think the movie reinforced that right up until the end to the well, extent maybe. where I was like, I was actually right. And then it pulled the rug out from under us in a way that I find very upsetting. So did you, did contrived, you maybe. Yeah. So uh, and I so, think so. They, wait, before you go, I, I didn't watch the trailer. So okay. you have to tell us first what you saw in that trailer yes. that made you think um, who the killer was yes. that you thought it was. Right. And like I said, it was totally based on it was based on two things in the trailer. And it turns out one of those things really would have made you think I was right if you were kind of going down the same logic. So I'm going to show you guys my little envelope, right? Okay. Yeah. She did a Kreskin, so yeah. she so I'm gonna, and I'm gonna guess who you guess. <laughs> Are you writing it down? I wrote it down. Yeah, it's. I mean, I think it's obvious. If you saw the trailer, I do think that they tried to lead you in this direction, and I think the film tries to lead you in this direction too. Okay. Oh, Stu Mocker. Stu. On her well, piece of paper, she says it's uh, Stu. Yeah. Okay. And then, so there. So Stu is in the trailer. OK, so I'm going to tell you why I think it's Stu and I'm going to say, what did you guess, Jeff? Oh, I thought you were going with Kirby. No, did no, you, no. Did Jeff, did you watch the trailer? Did you watch the trailer? I watched she the watched? trailer, but I don't think I ever thought it was Stu. But there was a, lot, gonna, there was a gonna, lot of online speculation. So this is the thing. I know yeah. I didn't watch any of the online speculation. Okay. But when I saw the trailer. There were two things that made me think it might be Stu. OK, number one was the mask which it turns out it actually is Stu's mask. Stu's so mask. Okay. they were leading you in that direction, I think. So okay. I saw the mask and then <laughs> this kind of shows you how deep I am in watching these movies. And my son is too. They do Stu's knife wipe. Oh, okay. but don't they do that in every one of them? They don't. We just rewatched them. And my son and I were watching for knife wipes. Nothing. Knife wipes. <laughs> yes. Knife wipes. <laughs> and the only other character that actually does a knife wipe is Mickey in the second one. And he does it differently. He does doesn't he do, do it. Do they he do does... the do they do the is it meta? Do they do the knife wipe in the stab movies? Have, yeah, do you ever see that? I think the stab movies oh, yeah, they do. Right. So but somebody the, could have picked up on that from the stab movie. But um, the knife wipe is like a Stu and Billy thing. And for of the killers, we were like watching for knife wipes. Knife wipes. <laughs> so interesting. Um, so based on the mask, I was like, it's an old mask, right? Yep. Yeah. And there's the knife wipe and then there's this deep lore if you're a scream nerd that in kevin williamson's original script for scream 3 that Stu mocker is still alive right there's no confirmation that he died and actually if you watch scream 1 when he has the tv thrown on his head he makes a little noise at the end so you could definitely speculate that he's still, he's alive, still alive the same way that kirby kind of miraculously comes back from the dead right because you don't see her fate at the end of scream 4 but she her, suddenly her character is here right and she says i actually did die for four minutes uh, yes yeah so yeah. so i saw that in the trailer and i was like oh, are they gonna like you know do this thing that people who know about like the original script for scream 3 i'm like that would be so great and if he killed gail that would sort of close Bring out everything full circle it would close out the old series mm -hmm. right in a right. really i think a very satisfying way Your legacy characters and it would be really unexpected and then like everything would be closed up and it would also be logical that Stu would try to catch up with Billy's daughter. Right. So like there was a logic that I was mm -hmm. working here and it was totally based on these two factors from the trailer. So we're watching the movie. Now, my son and I have been building on this theory, you know, with each other, totally based on the trailer. We're like, it's got to be Stu. It's got to be Stu. So then the night before we go see the movie, my husband somehow had not heard us spouting this theory, even though we talk about it nonstop. And he was like, what? So he goes online and he finds this deranged YouTube video where this woman spent nine minutes breaking down a three minute trailer talking about all these things that made her think it was Stu. And it turns out that a lot of people were doing the same thing I was yeah. reading into this trailer and thinking that it was Stu. And the way 
the film is constructed, which is it's counting backwards from yep. the last killers mm -hmm. back to the first one, right? And they keep saying it's counting back to one. And I'm like, so so you didn't is... let go of this theory until no, if anything, the end I of think, the movie. But isn't that the whole the the genius of this? That that there's no way you're gonna figure this out because you're right. They even addressed this in the movie, which I thought was genius. Because at one point they said something about student goes, oh, isn't he? I heard he was still alive. Right. So, so they're Mindy addressing says, the speculation right. online, yes. social media. Yes. So that's what so I'm saying. Can't I'm saying, be Stu, right? I'm saying like, that, ah, we knew it all along. I'm saying that the film was even leading you in that direction. The film is saying we're counting back to one. Who's number one? It's Stu and Billy. You know for sure Billy's isn't dead. That, isn't that a shot. red herring? Isn't that a misdirection? He was shot in the, the head, right? Then they say they have the casual comment, right? If you but that's the TV that's killed Stu Mocker. If you right. believe he's dead, yeah, okay. right? There you go. Then when he calls, when Ghostface calls Gail on the phone, he says, "I can't believe we never talked on the phone before." So all of this stuff in the film mm -hmm. is really. I feel they were toying with you. Yep. This idea. So I would like my heart was pounding. I was like, it's going to be Stu. It's mm -hmm. going to be Stu. I was so excited. And because of that, when I got to the end, I was like, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, well, it was it a, sounds like it was orchestrated, like they yes, did that on correct. purpose for yeah, fans like, such uh -huh, as yourself. Think that they, yeah, I think that. <sighs> but then you it's have to because you have you to give so you have up. to give people what they want. He, yeah, he's not even in it. You know, he's mentioned. But <laughs> no. Yeah. You know, if you're and I think, you know, like I said, if it was just in the trailer and then like it seemed like the film was going in a different direction, I would have let it go. But the film seemed like it was leading you in that direction. It sounds like they were purposely doing that. And like I said, it was Stu's mask, which was the thing that, right, right. that really convinced me from the trailer to begin with. And obviously, a bunch of other people are really invested in this mm -hmm. idea. And it just would have been such a nice closeout. Mm -hmm. They could have closed the, the chapter of the old films and they really could have taken their film in a new direction. But instead, what they do, which I honestly just think is lazy, they sort of bring back the family revenge plot, which is mm -hmm. the same as Mrs. Loomis and Scream 2, right? Mrs. Loomis comes right. back to kill Sydney because she killed her son. And then this is Richie's family comes back to kill Sam because she killed their family member. And I was like, this is so late. I was, uh, <laughs> I was and they, so angry. And they do it in such a way because it's, first of all, I knew that you must have thought, unless, because again, I didn't see this trailer that you were right. basing the whole totally theory on. It was totally based on the trailer. Yeah. So, and I'm thinking, unless they're introducing these characters by name, there's nobody new here mm. that Christina is thinking is the killer. Right. It's got to yeah. be a legacy character. Right. But as I'm watching the movie, I immediately focus, of course, on Ethan, you know, because he's mm. in the background. He's not saying anything. Everybody insults him, yet he still hangs around with these people. I'm like, is he even friends we, with them? We all have a friend like that who just <laughs> wants attention. I thought he and Danny, they would turn out to be the killers at the end. And I was half right. But I didn't get why Mindy was with him on the subway, yet survives. Like he goes to her aid, then yeah. you don't see them again. Right. And if he's the killer, why not take care of her? You right. know? Why not finish her off? Why is he yeah. saying, saying like, get a doctor, get a doctor? Like, what is, he is, what is the benefit of him yeah. actually carrying through when it's only him and her? Yes, so, I yeah. agree. That doesn't make any sense because he he thinks he and killed her. Full of people, though. <laughs> right. Can't so just... he stabs her. Like, why not finish her off? And then, you know. Again, that would have been really the connection back to Scream 2 because she's Randy's niece and Randy gets stabbed in yeah. the middle of in the public. day in yeah. public. Right. And he dies. And it would have the thing about Randy's death in the original series is it really makes you feel the stakes. It makes you feel anybody can die because you really care about that character. And like you were saying, Jim, because now you're like, well, these four people are always going to survive you don't have that same mm -hmm. sense of right. stakes, you know, yeah. because you're well, like, well, but we these... thought that Quinn was dead. I mean, I mean, the, the roommate and then they're all uh, I don't know. There was right. And I and that bothered me, too, a little bit, because I feel the one thing the screen movies have always done is kind of play fair with you. Yeah. 
it, yeah, that's, it, it, that's, it's it, like she's removed from the table so early. You don't even consider her as a possibility. And that's the other thing is that you don't really get to know the friend group, the the strength of the screen films that work, which, you know, I've always thought three was the weakest, although I still have things that I like about it. Now I would say this one is the weakest, but the strength of the screen films that work one, two, four and five is that you get to know this friend group. You get to know the characters as individuals, and not only do you care about them, but you also might suspect them. Mm. So you don't really get to know this friend group. Like, you don't really know Mindy's girlfriend. Like, no. you don't get to know Quinn, really. You don't get to know these people. And like Jim said, Ethan's sort of in the background. You don't get to know them. So you can't really, you can't care about them, and you can't suspect them either because they're not really, like, you know, they're not drawn as real characters here. Right. And the one that was a complete anomaly was the mystery boyfriend that lived Cute across boy. the hall. I called him angry boy because no. he's got the angriest face. I'm like, <laughs> okay. okay, past this movie, she's got a lot to deal with with this guy. Like, this guy's a mistake waiting to happen. <laughs> he, he put on his angry eyes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the monkeys. <laughs> Because when this guy <laughs> sees Ghostface, does he call the police? No, no, and he doesn't. He no. can just run around to he's the like, apartment, no. but he's screaming you, out the window. And he's like you. screaming at him, like as if like he's trying to assert his maleness. Like this is going to scare Ghostface away. Yo, bitch, what are you doing over there? And th th that's all he does. He doesn't. Even I know. No, that, that, that's. But he set up that no one trusts him. You don't trust him as an audience yeah. member. But it's almost too obvious. I will say that uh, listen i don't go into these because i i can never figure these stupid things out you know <laughs> i can't even figure out who scooby-doo's nemesis is at the end of the episode <laughs> when it finally came to the realization that they were using real masks from the actual crime scenes yeah you have to like how are they getting a hold of this so i know i can understand people. it comes I... down to the detective and it comes down to kirby and then we're throwing the little, but still, you know, oh, Kirby's not a real FBI but agent. But still, like, what's, there's a there's a throwaway line, like, you know, you can get anything if you have enough money. Every single piece of evidence from right. every single yeah. murder, is, is, really. And, this, and I love this idea. This whole, you know, uh, this this movie theater that's been turned into this shrine to not only the the, the stab franchise, but you know, to all these killings. And I'm like, we might be talking about like a cult. Like, mm -hmm. that's what I was looking for, because the one thing I hate about these movies, and I think then the five, you got these the minute these people, especially these little women, these girls that are in this costume are suddenly have like superhuman powers. It's like, is this like the Jason mask? Like, all of a sudden they can lift Dewey off the wall and stab him. The mm -hmm. little girl, she can't do that. So or or kill the psychiatrist through his wrought iron gate. Pull his face right through. In the eye, yeah. right in the nose. In the yeah. nose. <laughs> But I will say that the convenience store set piece was extremely that impressive. That was nice, even though you don't want to see Ghostbuster with or Ghostbuster, Ghostbuster. <laughs> Ghostface with a shotgun. I'm like, come on, this kid. I thought that was cool. Moment. I thought no, that was I, cool. Listen, I get it. And, and I'm screaming to these women, you know, those shells knock over. They don't think much to push them we, over. We haven't even mentioned Kirby yet. You know, poor Kirby, who's come back and is supposed to be the star of the of the movie. <sighs> well, she is. Uh, I don't know. And, I she, really... and, it, and this is what I mean when I talk about, like, you know, people are so invested in the stew theory is that. Hayden Panettiere said in an interview, she basically willed Kirby back into existence. She's, you know, she's called the filmmakers when they were making Scream 5. And she was like, you know, we never saw my character actually die on screen. And there were because and again, because it seemed so obvious that they were doing like a, a legacy thing, you know, Obviously, I was very invested in the stew idea, but when there were two ghost faces at the end, I didn't think the other one was Kirby. I thought it could be Mickey or Charlie because there those are two other characters who were killers who were mm. never actually shot in the head. So, it, you know, I was like, oh, it would be that would be even greater. <laughs> Again, to like close I would, out. I, I would actually yeah, love it. to see Kirby because she's like four feet tall, right? Tripping over the 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 ghost face robes. <laughs> yeah, no, they all fit perfectly, <laughs> and you have. Um, but I read somewhere that they couldn't find Hayden. 
that I guess in four they, they were looking her, for her for five. Doesn't have yeah. an agent, and and she was nowhere to be found. They couldn't contact her. So I find that interesting that she was begging to be a part of this. Yeah, um, and speaking about you know what they were planning on doing. Christina mentioned like you couldn't see even if they had Nev Campbell as Sydney, right where she where, where she would fit in. I did like looking into some some background on this. The script was completely different, and when they had written Could Sydney to into it, they yeah. had to start again from scratch, which is amazing because it took like a year for this to get made, written, and you know out in theaters. Yeah, because so, you're saying that it feels like just yesterday we were talking about the fifth. One. Yeah, mm-hmm. so. maybe that's part of the problem. It's the rush job. I just feel that the film was leading you in the direction of a, a legacy It character. sounds like they were purposely misleading you. And, and I, I get it. If you're a fan of this franchise, it would be very frustrating. You laid all the breadcrumbs. You lined everything once up you for say, this to happen. Once you show the TV yeah. and yes, you say... Yes. If oh, you was... believe he's dead, uh-huh. that yeah. is like an uh-huh. arrow to the heart of every <laughs> Scream fan, you know, because everybody who's deeply invested in this franchise knows that Kevin Williamson wrote that script with Stu in it. It's still alive, masterminding the killings from jail. So it's like we all know that there's still a possibility that oh, he's out know. there. He's too and busy I think, making Scooby movies to be killed. <laughs> and Matthew Lillard has said for years that he would love to come back. Why wouldn't he? Right. So, oh, he would be like he would be like Jason Voorhees. He'd have to yes. be like disfigured in yes, some way yeah, after right. taking yeah. that TV. Oh, to the imagine face. what his face looks like. And yeah. I just think that, and then you get to the end, and you're like, it's these lame kids and their yeah. dad. And like, they're dead. <laughs> it was like. No, this yeah. is not doing it for but me. But like I said, Ethan is is a give, right? Because you sure, got it. Yeah. Uh, if you're not if you're not like invested in wacko home theories like I am. <laughs> <laughs> but the other one, Quinn, I think is a cheat because is. you know yeah. Yeah. again, this is like, something oh, oh. you're only shown one thing and no, given no clues that answer, anything right. different is going on there. And the way he so, answers, yeah. he's like, oh, it's, it's a chief of police. It's easy to sneak into the crime scene, replace the body. It's like, what? That sounds like a lot of work. Uh, I completely forgot all about the Billy hallucinations. So I loved that idea that Sam could easily become or, you know, that, that they were using video early on where she was confronting the other girl and then they're using it against them on social media that, you know, building up this idea that that she was the mastermind behind all these killings to begin with. And uh, I, I like these two characters. I really like Tara and Sam. I oh, enjoyed no, I, it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like and, them too. Yeah. And, and their their whole subplot of Sam you know, being overprotective of Tara, you know, understandably. Yeah, so, sure. Um, it's like everyone I else is was moving on with their life. Yeah. She even says at one point, you know, the, the rest of us, I'm not going to live in fear. I'm moving on with my life. Yeah, but I think the door is open for a big question mark over Sam's head, you know? Because yeah, I she's think it's given you those a, breadcrumbs in this movie. Yes, correct. And it's almost, mm. I would probably be disappointed if the next movie she's the killer because they really set it up. Yeah. And they did also set up again, bringing Sydney back into a Gale, like kind of has dialogue that writes her out of the rest of the series. Mm-hmm. Like she deserves to have her happy ending. So you think with that, you're not going to see her again. I'm sorry that you were led down the rabbit hole. Well, I you know, like I nothing. said, it was, is completely based on those two things that I saw in the, well, but, the, but but apparently you're not alone. They they it does sound like they the creative went out of their way to make you think that this is what's going to happen. It was the the mask. I know you're like yeah. they all look the same to you. No, you, they no, all look I, the same, right? no. Well, it, that's it was, I mean, you watch these, <laughs> the Halloween movies, the masks do change. Yeah, no, it was a you know, like, we kept saying, is this a mask? No, it was more beat up. And you know? I was like, and I was like, this is the mask. And when I saw in the trailer, like that, it was all worn out. Right. I'm like, it's got to be, yeah. you know, an old killer coming back. And mm. like I said, they do lead you in that direction because it turns out it is Stu's mask and Quinn is wearing it. Right. But, yeah. but the even the plot of the film starts to track you back to Stu because, like I said, it's doing this countdown mm-hmm. thing. They mentioned that Stu might still be alive. The mm-hmm. the conversation with Gail on the phone. I mean, I was really like, they're really going to do it. And then yeah, when the, it was, the rug was, got pulled out from under I was yeah. so 
so disappointed, sort of like doubly disappointed because it I thought it was Stu. Yeah. It wasn't okay, but it was just a flat dupe of Scream yeah. 2. And I was like, if you're going to say you want to take this this series in a different direction and you're going to say that you want to do your own thing and carve your own path, I understand that, right? Scream 5 is a love letter to Wes Craven. They shot it like a Wes Craven movie. Kevin Williamson was on the set the whole time, like basically doing everything they could to make it as much like a Wes Craven movie as possible. So Scream 5 to me still really feels like a Wes Craven movie. They did that deliberately. Now they're saying, well, we want to do our own thing, but you you know, if you're going to just recycle the plot, that's not doing your own thing. Uh, I'm going to go back to the the nostalgia characters not being in jeopardy, because even when Mindy monologues again in this movie about um, the stakes that are involved, one of her big points is that nostalgia characters are not safe. Yet they are, because really the only sacrificial lambs here. Are the nameless boyfriend. And I think that was Quinn's boyfriend, right? Uh, yeah, it was Quinn's current boyfriend. <laughs> yeah, so she killed her own boyfriend and left him in the tub. So Quinn never even died. That was just a, a given. Then the psychiatrist is a victim. And then poor Annika. This is apparently three right. people can't hold the ladder <laughs> still. <laughs> Not when Ghostface is shaking it. I would also just question instead of like, you know, they were what, like maybe two stories right from the bottom right. of yeah. the. So maybe why wouldn't you why wouldn't you just put the, the ladder across and then use it to go down yeah. instead of trying to cross dangerously to the next? The bigger apartment. question is, why does he have a ladder? Why does he have a big ass <laughs> ladder that doesn't even retract? Hold on. I got you. <laughs> Yeah. Why did you leave your apartment and come around and save Quinn? Knock on the door. I leave my brain at the door with these. I'm movies. usually. Um, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm not. I can't Nick, pick it apart. Uh, I will say I really enjoyed this. I actually like this a lot. This is amazing. Yeah, this, is, this, is, oh, this is this is like five. a that's why I said is... it's bizarre world this week. <laughs> I didn't have the expectations suck, right? You are so invested in this franchise. You so want this character to come back. They are leaving you clues telling you that this could be the character. I would be excited, too. Yeah. And, you know, and you got Billy in these flash, you know, in these little ghost things. He's coming back. Skeet Ulrich is like he looks like he's 20 years old, even though we know he's not. Right. And like I said, I wasn't I obviously wasn't the only person who was invested in this right. theory. Yeah. because I, I don't care about Richie. I you know, care about the family that, you know, it's like, oh, OK, I, I'm just along for the ride. And I really liked it. You know, there's a, a saying I heard once called expectations are resentments under construction. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Wow. <laughs> what do you mean that didn't come out the way I wanted it to? You're an idiot. And no. I like I said, if I had gone into this film and the film had developed itself differently, then Your I wouldn't have, would have changed. Yeah. I wouldn't have been as upset, you know, if I was like, oh, well, obviously, like the trailer, I was just like reading something to the trailer, but clearly something else is happening here. But I really genuinely felt like the film was trying to lead you in that direction and then like yank the rug out from under me. And because I'm just that. I'm just glad that it wasn't Kirby, that for about five hot minutes in this movie, <laughs> Yeah, but that doesn't um, even make they sense. They point the he, fingers at Kirby. But that doesn't even make sense. She has an FBI van and surveillance system. Well, if that's, she wasn't with the FBI, because where would she get that? Dermot from? is obviously lying when he tells them that she is uh, unhinged. Yeah. And meanwhile, she locked the gate when they got into that facility. How did he get in there? How did he even get in there? Again, you start pulling well, holes. Well, doesn't he own it? Ghost, well, ghost here, here comes and I, goes. I was hoping that you, both of you could maybe make this clearer for me. So. Dermot's family had rented this theater yep. because Richie was amassing all these um, yep. ephemera from from the previous murders. Right. So it's always been in New York City because Richie does not live in New York City. Right. Yeah. So then to throw suspicion off of them, they put it in the names of Jason and Greg. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, they got a they got a. Right. And then Podcast he says he was going to they must be. He says he was going to plant the information. But that Gail was such a good journalist. She actually ferreted it out. OK, all off screen, by the way. We, what and was was Dermot 
always a New York City detective or did he transfer to New York City? To- I, think that, I think that Quinn said something about her father following her or was that or was I wrong in that? She says that, but who knows if it's right. true, well, that's because, true it, because she was the whole thing it. is organized yeah, yeah, because, yeah, you yeah. know, Ethan okay. says, yep. you know, you're right, Mindy. It is easy to manipulate the roommate lottery, mm-hmm. yeah. right? Yeah. So I don't see, buy him as a killer at all, by the way. I liked it up until a point. Mm. And I will quote the teenagers. I don't know if they were too young and they snuck in or if they were just over the R rated limit because they would seem to be right on the cusp. But anyway, they were coming out behind me. And one of them said to the other, well, what did you think? And the guy said, it's I. It's I. <laughs> and then he said, but the ending sucked ass. And I'm like, that's a pretty good. That's a pretty good sucked assessment. Ass. <laughs> I feel I feel after a while, uh, these endings are convoluted. And then as I was leaving, I was because I figured that there wouldn't be. But as I was leaving, I did my search. Is there an end credit? It's like, yes, there is. I had to come back to the theater, go in back into the theater and sit down. I missed it. What was it? Um, It wasn't anything to. It's just a little. It's a joke, actually. It's Mindy saying that every movie needs an end credit scene. Was that before or after she got stabbed? It should have been. <laughs> it, it was it, while it, it seemed like it was taken out of the monologuing scene. Yeah, my son and I were just sitting there trying uh, to process our feelings. Yeah, I was gonna say you're like just <laughs> catatonic, staring at the screen, going, "Really? That that's what this was?" Uh, I did get an audible gasp from my uh, lady next to me when uh, the uh, hunky boyfriend had his shirt off. <laughs> I was out of nowhere. And, she goes, I, and I'm like, <gasps> that, oh that's another that's another red flag. It's like because this guy is obviously can see into their apartment and he looks Maybe. into their apartment and whatever chance yeah. he can get. He can see them having dinner. They're unbothered by this. So their windows are just thrown open. No curtains. So uh, you'll be surprised what you can see in Manhattan windows. I mean, or, or, I'm sorry, Montreal. <laughs> I mean, you kind of know he can't be the killer because he's ironing his T-shirt. <laughs> he was too he's he was ironing too, he was too, his uh... t-shirt well he's got to vent his anger somehow right <laughs> that's right um i think we're ready for buckets here i think yeah. we probably have been for quite some I, time i can't believe this is gonna happen jeff's gonna give this movie higher buckets than i am four and a quarter <laughs> four and a quarter out of five quarter. this is pushing quarter. the the bucket ceiling four and a quarter i, I gave it an eight on imdb yeah, I really like this. I, I again, I guess expectations be damned. I did, you know, low expectations, no expectations. I couldn't remember anything about five. I didn't care about five. <laughs> I still cursed you that you made me watch five. So I went in. I'm like, all right, we're going to watch this. And I was pleasantly amused. I, I just left my brain at the door. I didn't think about it too hard. I didn't try to figure out who this killer was because for all I know the mask comes off and it's friggin' Sydney at the end which would have been a hell of a reveal but I got it I liked it now I liked the change of scenery I liked the switch up you know to and moving to New York City because I think that the set pieces that that allows were a lot more interesting than just the same recycled stuff that you're used to seeing in the other screen movies but again that ending was just too much you know like, like you're saying yeah turn your brain off at the door when you go into these but that was too much to take in and i think it was too long as well that oh, well, yeah, this is ending hours, just went yeah. on i think and it was all at, oh, around the ending that went on for way too long i'm like come on just wrap this up now you know i'm ready to leave <laughs> i gotta go so um I'm going to go one bucket less. I'll give it three and a quarter um, just for the the new surroundings. The new cast is likable, but I did have a, a big problem with none of that nostalgia cast being expendable. Like even Gail gets stabbed again. Right. And uh, and is OK by the end of it. So well, everybody survived. Her, uh, so the, the stakes weren't there. Her scar it, tissue saved her. Yeah. Apparently, that's what we all need. Three and a quarter from me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is paid you. This paid I mean, you. it's very hard. I mean, I agree. I like the new cast. I didn't necessarily mind the switch in New York. It was just that I really felt they didn't really play fair with you. And you were duped. The mystery. And it just doesn't, it didn't build the way a lot of the other films did you know where you're suspecting different characters and you're trying to 
figure it out. For me, that just wasn't there. And, you know, I'm the most invested in this series. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the most likely to be disappointed. disappointed. <laughs> but you weren't disappointed with the last one. No, I thought the last one was fine. I didn't like it as much as, you know, the other ones. But yeah. I thought the last one was fine. So I was actually hopeful that this would, you know, be really good going forward. I was like, well, it's in good hands and they'll be sort of good stewards of the franchise. I mean, you have to think about how different Scream is from other franchises where there's usually like a variety of directors, right? So like the quality kind of goes up and down and it was Wes's series. And like I said, the last film was so respectful of his style. And I appreciate that they want to do their own thing but this plot of this movie was a huge letdown. So I'm going to say two and Oof. three quarters. Oof. Yeah. Took a well, hit. it did well. It's a opening day record for this franchise. Wow. So um, it made 19 million on Friday. I'm not sure what it's going to do because we're still in the weekend um, that it's opened. Yeah, so far it's breaking records for the franchise. So I'm sure there'll be more. Yeah, th this is interesting because I just read this this morning while I was actually waiting for you to solve your internet issues, Jim. The Radio Silence guys were actually asked about Stu Mocker, and they said, never say never, anything can happen. Oh, see, that, I don't like that. So, so now your expectations they, are right through the roof. Exactly. Again. Exactly. Well, because they you're not going to be wow. happy until he, uh, no. he appears as Ghostface. It's, right. And, and then it's you're not like, like, no, no, see, I told you. Like I said, it's not just me because, uh, like I said, other people who are even more invested in their theories so apparently are out there like making YouTube breakdowns about why it's Stu. It, I just feel that they were really leading you in that direction. That's all. I just feel like I wasn't the only one. No, you were And not. they're out there saying anything can happen. If it's not Stu in the next movie, you know, people are just going to start screaming and breaking things. But it would have been logical in this movie if they'd it done it. It would have been based and on what And it would have been an opportunity, again, to like, they could have killed off Gail, but she survived. Yeah. They could have closed that loop. Yeah. And you would have put away the original series, right? And you would have said, okay, now we're going forward and we're going to do our own thing. It just would have been logical. All right. So I think we've exhausted the topic of Scream mm -hmm. 6 for I am now. I'm exhausted. I'm going to scream. Um, but, so let's go to the concession stand. And oh, our host our host this week will be Christina. Yes. So I picked Kit Kat because Break I don't know. A piece of that Kit Kat. Dun, we've, dun, dun. Ha we've had a couple <laughs> of um, treats that like maybe we don't actually eat at the, <laughs> no, the theater. I mean, like Pixie Sticks <laughs> and Bubblegum. And I don't know if you guys ever eat Kit Kats at the theater, but I do. Um, when I go to the music box, that's what I always get because they have that in their candy section. So um, they always have the king size Kit Kats. So um, do we all like Kit Kats? Yeah. Yes. I'm yes. out of my way for them, but if they're available in my house, I will absolutely. Oh, yeah. No, if my son comes back on Halloween night, I will scam some Kit Kats out of his bag. And usually those are the the little the the two yeah. bar Kit Kat varieties, the you know, the the snack pack varieties where you but you still get that satisfying I'll snap. Break them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got to break them off. You can't just chomp down on a Kit yes. Kat the way that it is. You got to break them off. And I think what's one of the reasons why I like Kit Kat is because really it's a cookie, right? It's a chocolate covered cookie. It's not yeah, like a, yeah. it's not a candy bar. It's a it's a it's a like a wafer. So kind of some fun history here. It's produced globally by Nestle. It was originally created by Round Trees of York in the United Kingdom. And it is it has no affiliation with the Ferraro Company. In the U.S., it's made by the Reese's Candy Company, which is a division of Hershey. So the versions you get in other countries are slightly different, and we can actually talk about this as kind of fun. There are many, many, many Japanese-exclusive Kit Kats, where they make really super unique Kit Kat flavors. Um, Sushi? N no, but like they make really fun 
different flavors like that I've gotten from the Japanese market. They're just things like that they they make like a creme brulee Kit Kat. Um, you can actually like heat it up in the microwave. I've gotten them in like these snack packs, like where we get treats from Japan, and they they do a lot of unique things over there. But anyway, so the original four finger is what they call it version of the bar, the sort of standard bar that you find, was developed um, after a worker at Roundtree's York factory put a suggestion in the recommendation box for quote a chocolate bar that a man could take to work in his pack up so it was supposed to be like something you could take in your lunch box basically it was launched in september 1935 in the uk wow. as round trees chocolate crisp i think that's one of the things that's been interesting about this series right is how many of these candies are like pre-world war ii <laughs> yeah and the later two finger version was launched in 1936 it was renamed Kit Kat Chocolate Crisp in 1937 and just Kit Kat after World War II. It made its first television appearance in a UK commercial in 1958. And the slogan for Kit Kat in the UK has been have a break, have a Kit Kat, which is still their slogan. And so, so the two finger version, as you say, has always yeah. been that snappable. Yeah. Version. Okay. It's sort of a uh, funny thing, though. The use of the name Kit Kat um, for a type of food actually goes back to the 18th century <laughs> when mutton pies, known as a Kit Kat, were served at meetings of the political Kit Kat club. Because <laughs> they were made of cat. <laughs> so obviously like it has expanded throughout the world and um i talked a little bit about the really fun japanese flavor flavors in japan it's um distributed through the, the fujia company nestle's sale of its u.s confectionery business to the ferrara candy company in 2018 did not impact the Kit Kat bar so it's still made by Hershey in the U.S. It has nothing to do with Ferrara. Mm, totally I was going to no, no, say no, we're that, keeping that. We're if keeping you go that to Her if you go to Hershey Park and you take mm -hmm. the world famous chocolate tour, there's you know big displays of all their various chocolates, be it Reese's or you know the Hershey bar or what have you, and Kit Kat looms large in Hershey Park. If you um. Do you guys like some of the other flavors? They started producing different flavors in 1996. Uh, Kit Kat Orange was the first flavor mm. variant that they introduced see, in the UK. For, for me, that's too artificial. I don't like mm. those with the, the feeling of eating chemicals or, you know, that it gives more of a wax and after, yeah. yes, after right. effect. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah. you know what I used to like to do with Kit Kats is, you know, obviously break them. You know, I'd always break them. I would never just take a bite out of like a full four finger Kit Kat. Mm -hmm. But I always used to like to break them and then chew off the ridges. I would chew <laughs> off the chocolate ridges the around chocolate the Kit Kat. Extra. Yes. Wow. So, That's devotion right there. I had no clue that they made alternate Kit Kats. I mean, even in the U.S., like you can no, get. No, I don't think I've ever come across it. just the red bag, the little. In fact, Bar, right here it. next to me, I have a white chocolate Kit Kat. Oh, I, okay. All right. I have so some. they have dark Never chocolate. Mind. They have white chocolate. They have strawberry Ooh, chocolate. They have mint. Chocolate. They've been doing like special Halloween ones, you know, that come out. They do, they usually do um, like holiday seasonal flavors. I've noticed right. they'll do like Easter, an Easter version, a Halloween version. What um, does the Easter taste like? It depends. Sometimes they'll do like a lemon one for Easter, for spring. You know, it's actually pretty nice. Like tastes almost like um, like a like a lemon crisp cookie. You know, because mm. it's got like it's got that really light lemon light, flavor. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's I actually like the the spring version a lot. My son really likes the strawberry ones, and I mentioned the Japanese flavors. Nestle has introduced over 300 different flavors in Japan, including ginger ale, soy sauce, creme brulee, which I mentioned earlier, green tea, sake, and banana. They're often bought as good luck gifts, as the brand name echoes the Japanese. Good luck liking them. <laughs> well, no, because there's a, there's a Japanese phrase, kitokatsu, which means surely win. It's like a good luck. Okay. Thing, so they they're given as good luck gifts huh. in Japan. 
one really fun thing I discovered was um, there was a golden ticket draw in the oh. UK where they did like a promotion um, to distribute 100 golden tickets randomly throughout Kit Kats. Um, and it was actually, you would think it would be a Charlie and the Chocolate Factory say, promo, that's a, that's but actually uh... it was, people were invited to the Big Brother series, I guess. <laughs> it was, it was basically like if you, the Big Brother series in the UK and members of the public who found the tickets were like, were able to use them to give themselves a chance to become uh, a Big Brother housemate on this TV series. Yeah, you can keep that. <laughs> when did um, when did it move from the UK to the US? It was introduced in the US in 1970s. So, oh. it's, yeah. so it's a relatively young candy yeah. in terms of the United States. But I'm more shocked by the fact that it was in existence for almost 30 years before it actually there was an advertisement for it. Um, the first advertisement was in the 50s. So, a TV advertisement. And I'm surprised that its name from the U.K. survived Saved, yeah. into the U.S. Because usually the, the U.S. and the U.K. have the same candy bar, but they're called something different in each country. If you look at the Wikipedia page for Kit Kat, it's kind of fun. There's actually, they show the wartime packaging for Kit Kat. It's like a blue wrapper. It looks completely different. Hmm. Blue's not very appetizing. Yeah, so this is like a pretty fun one if you... I think because of, like, in other countries, they, you know, there's been, like, this kind of variety of flavors and stuff. But it sounds like you guys pretty much just eat the standard Kit Kat. The standard, yeah. yeah. I might have to seek out the dark chocolate, though. Um, or look for the springtime version, the lemon yeah. ones. I'll pass they're, on that. They're yummy. Oh, Easter's coming, so they must yeah. be out. So put away your wallet, Jeff. It's Christina's treat this week. <laughs> mm. Yeah, baby. Everybody come around. <laughs> We're buying. So you guys yeah, they want the four fingers, though. <laughs> you want a four finger that. standard? Is that what I want, you want that giant. I want the giant one. You want the king Ooh, size? I want the king size. Jeez, yeah. How many king size is, is basic. It's basically two four finger bars put mm. together. So yeah, that, I, that's uh, that's some ridges for me to nibble on like a rabbit <laughs> around the outside. You'll be busy for hours. Yeah. <laughs> What's funny is I always <laughs> get <laughs> it, <laughs> and then I end up eating like five of the sticks. <laughs> and then I always come home with three because I, I it's like it's like it's too big for me to finish Much, up the movie. Yeah. <laughs> I love the logo too. It's one of my favorite logos on on a candy bar. Is the Kit Kat logo? Kit Kat. It's a very action oriented logo. There's a lot of slanting going on. Yeah, because there is action involved. You got to snap it. There you go. There, there's there's many, a, there's a physicalness to the Kit Kat. That's Miss Crumbles that are like falling away. I don't think it's too crumbly. I think actually as a they have sort of the right amount of chocolate in between the biscuit so that when you snap it you're it's not really solid. Snap, biscuit, yeah. you're not really it's snapping the bar like the cookie you're snapping the chocolate you know what's crumbly is the twix bar that's a mess uh, waiting yeah. to happen we'll talk about that on another episode but yeah that's kit kat it's yeah. something i actually eat at the theater so i thought that would be okay. a fun one yeah because um not too crunchy know. yeah i think it no it it doesn't actually make any more noise than a popcorn. So Ooh, yeah. speaking of popcorn, you know what I had this week? Not the, I had the little Cheetos. The little Cheetos uh, when they mix the uh, the hard Cheetos in with the popcorn. Mm, mm. I don't I, like Cheetos. So. Oh. Mm. Yeah, well, not but, like the fluffy ones, the hard, the crunchy ones. I don't. Know I don't like any kind of Cheetos. Oh, oh man, yeah. my fingers are still orange. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go back to the theater. All right, let's go back. And let's talk about an actual Wes Craven movie. Yes. <laughs> Had to bring Wes into this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. New <laughs> Nightmare. Well played on this one, by the way. And again, I say New Nightmare, but it was new as of October 1994. So, Oh, I thought it was 93. No, 94. 94. So if, if you're a pessimist... You could say that this movie was dated as soon as it was released because of its title. Unfortunately, it is the lowest grossing of the entire Nightmare on Elm Street series. It Why cost, is that, though? Why do you th I think maybe it was just before its time. A little too yeah. meta. It I definitely very, think, very meta. Yeah. And I think that, you know, my son said this movie has a few rough edges. I'm like, yes, it does. But <laughs> I think 
that he was really trying to go for something here. He was trying to bring the series back to the way he had written it in the first place, where like Freddie was a scary character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I if you think if you think too much about this, it could break your brain. This mm-hmm. movie. This is like looking at a picture of somebody taking their own picture in a mirror, and it just. Yeah. <laughs> It's like Captain Crunch on the box holding the box of Captain Crunch, and on that yes. box is Captain Crunch holding the box yes. of Captain Yes, yes, the um, infinite loop. So it cost eight million to make. It only made nineteen point eight at the box oh, wow. office. It made more than its budget, but it wasn't a super hit like the other movies in the series were. Um, so ninety four. What else was out that year? You know, what I found it, interesting is that I'm sorry. Go ahead. Finish it opened. My original it, question. it opened against Pulp Fiction, which didn't. Help. Oh, mm-hmm. gotcha. That's a movie I went into completely blind. So, ah, oh, interesting. And one of the things that's interesting about the film is they're sort of, again, like in the Scream films, they're sort of addressing the way fans feel about the series, right? Because yeah, this like, was people, like pre-internet. This is pre-social like, media, too. They're like, people are angry that... Uh, you know, the the last chapter had Freddie die. People are like, is Freddie really dead? And I think I told you when we watched Night- Nightmare on Elm Street that I also watched this documentary, I Am Nancy, which featured Heather Langenkamp, where she talked about the legacy of that character and also how it's so weird while people really glamorize the villain in this series. And when she goes in the film, when she goes to the the interview, and everybody in the audience is holding signs saying we love Freddie and people are wearing the mask and the the mm-hmm. and the glove and the sweaters. And then everyone's excited because Robert Englund comes out and then like it feels exactly like the documentary I Am Nancy, where she was walking around talking to people like, oh, I was Nancy in the Nightmare on Elm Street. And people are like, where's Robert? You know, now I was one of the few, apparently, that did see this upon its release. I remember seeing this at the drive in, actually. I saw this at college, like Mm -hmm. in the, you know, how like, I don't know if your college did this, but I went to University of Albany. We had like, there was a little theater on campus Mm -hmm. and I saw it at the campus theater. And I hadn't seen probably a a Nightmare on Elm Street movie in the theater since three. And, you know, this brought me back knowing that Wes Craven was directing this. And I thought it was fascinating. I remember Mm -hmm. at the time. Yeah. This is really cool. Is that really her husband? You know, because that's Wes Craven in the movie. And I assume that this Shay guy is the real guy. Yeah, it was. And and, um, (laughs) because he's not a great actor. No, he's a horrible actor. (laughs) And he's a bit of a bag. But yeah. So that really is her husband? No, No, it's not. It's it's not. They actually did. She's married to a makeup artist. So and they asked him to do it. But he's like, oh, this is too close to home. Like maybe he was maybe a little spooked about (laughs) he had to die in a car accident. (laughs) Yeah. And like it it does feel in so many ways like it is a bit of a warm up for the Scream franchise. You know, like I said, even down to the phone rings and everyone turns in dread to stare at the phone and then someone's going, don't pick it up. And then the other Mm -hmm. character picks it up anyway. And then you hear Freddie's voice over the phone. Right. So it does seem like it prefigures the scream series in some way. And he's trying to explore some interesting ideas here. I'm not sure if it's completely successful, but I think it's an interesting exercise. And I love the way Freddie looks in this film. He looks menacing. I, I took the exact same note. I said, uh, yeah, um, because I guess, you know, after the first one, it became so popular. And then and when we talked about this with Nightmare, I'm saying that he became like almost like a joke in the later movies. He was very comical or whatever. Uh, so the idea that he's just, just again, just this menacing creature that may or may not say anything um you know and you start right off it, 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 the opening montage is an homage to the original movie's opening montage yes where they're making the the, the claws and whatnot mm-hmm. and you find out that you know they're on set they're making a movie and there's Wes Craven so I I this is the first time I've ever seen this and I will say this Jim you said you watch it on YouTube as well no, uh, they actually oh, had sorry. a copy at my library, okay. so I had the you no know, the the old DVD. 
Okay. Well, I will tell you, I did pay two ninety nine for YouTube. And shame on you, YouTube, because your closed captioning is horrible. The misspelling and the complete lack of words. If I was like forced to watch this movie with no sound, I wouldn't have understood what was going on. Bad, horrible. I want my two ninety nine back. Okay. So, well, I just, the, I've never seen that before. That it was that. Yeah. I mean, the misspellings were just. It was, there wasn't it, a better. There wasn't a better place for you to rent it. No. No, that was it. I rented it on Apple, like on the, oh. you know, Apple movies. But the claw coming alive and you realize it's a movie set and that they're making another prop. But, you know, it is very nightmarish because it doesn't look like that's what's going on, because you see like the the set, which is Freddy's layer of the 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 flames coming out of the ovens. And like, like it looks like a kiln that they're building this thing oh, over. Can I just ask this about and whoever is building it is wearing the sweater. So, you you know, it looks like it's Freddy <laughs> right. doing it. So it makes more sense when you realize it's actually a nightmare that you're watching. But the thing the the glove does like an evil dead kind yes. of, a, you know, yeah. it comes off yeah. the like it's a cross between the face hugger mm-hmm. and the hand yes. from yes. evil dead. Yeah. And then Nancy wakes up in the middle of an earthquake and then you're into the movie like this. But is, you also find out that these two guys were killed. So did this really take place late, no. uh, later? There's yeah. some weird. Yeah. Well, no, because the other real, because what's... when when the husband is on set, he says that they didn't show up. Right. In the beginning. Right. So it could be. Yeah, they could be dead as early yeah. as the beginning the one, of the movie. And the one thing I read is that they purposely did not put opening credits in this movie. So you never know if what you're watching is a dream, if it's mm-hmm. real or if it's all in her. Head. It, it, yeah, it's very. There's a lot of layers to like scenes where like she's having a nightmare. She wakes up. And then she wakes up again, right? right? Like she's having a nightmare within a nightmare. Like I love the way this film plays with your perception and yeah, like no, trying I... to make you figure out like, is this actually happening? Is she having a dream? You know, she talks a little bit like the character talks about like I have these mental health issues in my family. Yeah, she's worried that her son is, is going crazy. It's just interesting because it creates uncertainty. It creates uncertainty in the movie, right? Like, is this actually happening? Is this, or? is she crazy? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't like the the fact, because we know what this character went through in the first movie. Mm-hmm. Um, like the kid is clearly having issues and he's dreaming about Freddie. Oh, this, this the, kid? But it's just like, why do you keep putting this kid back in his own bed? Like, mm-hmm. like there's some real, first of like, all first of all this kid is miko hughes this is gage, yeah, oh, gage yeah. from pet cemetery gage from pet cemetery i'd be and like he almost the, gets the, hit by a truck again the, 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 the first time he screamed in my face i'd be like no mas i'm taking this kid back to where i got him from <laughs> Take it all, get back in the ground <laughs> Yes, I couldn't believe it when I realized that that kid is. But yeah, you know, we talked about this husband and he his acting skills are not very sharp. But he goes on, he starts lecturing her about dreams. And I'm like, this is f-ing Nancy. She should be lecturing you. Yeah. The only thing cool about that guy was his Fangoria t-shirt. Other than that. And like- then he dies in a way that calls back to the bathtub scene in yes. the original. Yes film where the, the but you're three comes hours out. away it's a three hour commute to your job uh he's you know he said he was going to work on a commercial right three hours away that like he just got there me. now he has to leave and come back mm-hmm. yeah I, okay. yeah he seems pretty unconcerned with her issues at the beginning no and the the house is pretty much like like torn apart from this earthquake all right gotta go to work <laughs> someone else is gonna have to deal with that giant crack in the wall Right. And the interesting thing, too, is it's sort of implied that the there's so many earthquakes because Freddy's emerging. Right. That it's not just they're not just regular earthquakes. But everyone is feeling these earthquakes. Right. Almost. Although, well, yeah, Almost. you're right, because at one point she did say and she's like, oh, well, no, a truck went by. Maybe that was it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. There's all these plants as well that I loved picking up on that I would have never have noticed the first time. The news logo. It looks like claw marks. Right. The mailbox that they have yeah. is like a yeah. kiln. Yeah. Is it even real? Right. You know, and the, that's... Whole, the, the end of the first movie where you think that all is well and then, you know, mom gets sucked it through the window there. And then the scene like, you know, where she's at this funeral for her husband and 
there's a earthquake, right? She thinks Dylan is getting sucked into the underworld by Freddie, but then maybe she just knocked herself on the head and it, it, it didn't, you know, it was just a dream. Yeah, I, I really like all the layers he's trying to put into this film. And, you know, even this idea that all three of them are having nightmares. Wes is having nightmares. Robert England is having nightmares. Mm-hmm. Heather Langenkamp is having nightmares. Everyone who's connected with the original film is having these nightmares of this character. Except Bob Shea, apparently. <laughs> well, no, because she asks Bob, why don't you answer the phone? Mm-hmm. Right. And he kind of gives her this look. And he's like, somebody else can answer. Yeah. Yeah. Phone. We have well, well he is Bob Shea. You know? you know, I'm sure he doesn't answer his phone. <laughs> I love the concept of this film. And I love how, you know, Robert England's characters or, you know, the Freddy character is so much more menacing, menacing. Mm-hmm. And he's he's wearing like these big boots he's got like leather pants he's got the long trench coat you know he and just kind of looks this mecha- now he has the mechanical hands yeah which and is now what they he- were making for the movie so again you know the reality is kind of getting blurred here a little hmm. bit you know this poor kid is experiencing all this she sees the dinosaur she sees that rex is clearly torn open by freddy's claws mm-hmm. and yet she's dismissive of this kid it's well, like it's like she suddenly becomes because in the first movie, that's the whole point is that you know no one believes her what's going on. Mm-hmm. And and the idea that she is now that parent and you've already experienced it, but you're not addressing this kid. Oh, I'm going to leave him with the babysitter. Well, that's not going to end well. We know that's not going to end well. Well, you know, it's like you can kind of see, though, where part of her is like this can't actually be happening. Right. Because what would you think? If someone I don't know. To Listen. Call you, you know, <laughs> you know, saying you know, I'd be the- questioning everything. I'd be like, I'm I'm freaking maybe I am loony. Maybe my mm. whole family's. Crazy. No, again, it's back to the kid. As, as soon as he starts reciting Hansel and Gretel to me, like out of memory, I'd be like, you got to leave my house, kid. This, I, I can't. <laughs> well, sleep why are you here. reading this kid Hansel and Gretel <laughs> to begin with? Yeah. But as soon as we go down that road, I'm like, oh, it's clearly we now know how she's going to get rid of Freddie. Right. And if this guy is so afraid of fire, why does he live in a friggin' kiln? Why is he living with, with fire all over the place? He should be in the Fortress of Solitude in, in, in Antarctica. No fire here. So so Chase Chase gets killed in the car. And of course, it's due to the claws. And then he crashes the truck. Heather goes to identify the body. And they tell she her wants straight up it. she doesn't need to go. But once she's there, well, as long as you're here, please sign. Yeah. And I think <laughs> no, a couple of a couple of the attendants, it looks like they're cutting deer in the morning. Yeah, and the other guy's eating his lunch. Yeah, they're packaging up some hamburger meat. And then when she goes to... <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah. The, the, the body obviously has long claw marks. It's not just her that should be recognizing the fact, okay, there's no corresponding thing in this car that would have made those marks, you know, but nobody else. Yeah, it was a bad accident. That's why we never pulled the sheep below the below the tree. Yeah, okay. By the way, did you recognize the morgue attendant? W. No. Earl Brown? He played Kenny in Scream 1. He plays Gail's cameraman. Oh, oh yeah. no. And Didn't also he, and also he plays Dan on Deadwood, which mm-hmm. is why I love oh. him. Actually, I was yeah. hoping every time that phone rang, it was Roger Jackson. <laughs> but we also get john saxon playing himself here yes in a very fatherly role okay, so he so he is the heather he's, he's her dad yep in the movies so he's yeah. the actor who plays the dad in the movies and yes. she goes to him for advice and i okay. love that scene at the end when he becomes his character and suddenly she's standing there in her pajamas and well, this is the other thing too where all of a sudden she's back in the movie He's mm-hmm. like, he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, yeah, there's a lot of like, what the, okay. You're just and, supposed to, you know, go with it. Oh, no, listen, yeah. I, I enjoyed this ride immensely. This was, yeah. this was very, you know, like you said, I think that this movie was way ahead of its time because it is very meta and the idea that they are filming a Freddy movie, they're playing themselves. And this, and you know what's weird is I think the same year, The Last Action Hero with Arnold Schwarzenegger came out, same premise where he is the character from the movie that the kid gets sucked into. So, and again, uh, that, that movie. Well, didn't they do that with Stay Tuned as well with John Stay Ritter? T- and- Stay Tuned was a little more like he was jumping. He was sucked into TV. He was getting sucked into the storylines um, of the different sitcoms and whatnot. 
uh, this is this is really taking this idea that that you said you know has become kind of like these screams where they're very meta and they're very aware of what they are and the expectations of the audience. I think that you know seeing this in the theater, I would have been like, "What the hell is going on here?" But I know seeing this in the theater, and it, I, it still made me do it. It's a scene in the playground where they're not even looking at Dylan, and they're like, "But they're talking to each other about how worried they are about Dylan." Meanwhile, yeah, they're ignoring him yeah. until he goes to the top of the this huge the Empire State Building of Jungle yes. Gyms. Yeah. And suddenly he's an adult that leaps off in slow motion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I did read that his dad bought him that after the filming. I said, if I was a kid that lived in the neighborhood and I go there one day and all of a sudden it's gone. Yeah, they took it to Miko's house. I'm like, oh, jerk. <laughs> you know, one thing I really, Wes Craven was a college professor before he started making movies and you know he does have kind of this deep intellect that even the whole premise of the original nightmare on elm street film is like a deeply intellectual concept right and you can really see he's trying he's trying to make us yeah, yeah he's trying to make a scary movie but also trying to make a smart movie that has all these layers mm. in it well i thought and, that was interesting because when heather actually sees him and, and she says are you still having the dreams are you still having nightmares because that is the the catalyst for how we came up with that right we talked mm -hmm. about that in the nightmare on elm street mm. episode and he makes himself the catalyst of what's happening in this movie because everything starts happening when he starts writing writing it the script which is also very right and I'll just burn the script <laughs> one of the things i like is that when you get to the end and she, first of all, I like how she kind of follows the breadcrumbs right through Literally. his bed <laughs> right. into Freddy's lair, yeah. which I think is just a really kind of cool visual where she like goes to the end of the bed and it keeps going. Yes. Right. Yeah. And then she comes into Freddy's lair and it actually is very reminiscent of kind of a Greek temple, right? It looks a little bit like Medusa's lair in Clash of the Titans. Yeah. And one of the things I notice is that there's a jar that says lathe in Greek mythology. The lathe is the river of forgetfulness. Huh. So, you know, it's almost like, is he trying to say, like, if you fall into this, if you fall into this water, you'll forget, you'll forget your yeah. real life you'll forget reality i mean you know i just feel like he's trying she's to get very it. aware of the fact of where she is i you actually know. think i knew that but i forgot it well it's i think it, it just goes it, it makes sense his layer because they're trying to establish that this isn't really freddy it's like an entity that's right. taken the form See, of freddy that's that, existed I kinda, for I lost eons that. i guess that was the concept that this was some demon that was just taken on freddy's form Mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't really I didn't really pick up on that in the while watching it until he changes at the end. Mm -hmm. There are two characters in this movie that are even scarier than this new Lynn iteration Shea? of Freddy. No, no. First of all, the limo driver. Yes, he's a creep. He's a creep. What the what's going on? God. Yes. Dude, he's no. I'll about... drive myself. Uber it. Oh, it's dude. like this is his first and last day on the job. This limo driver. It's a little too skippy. Yeah, and he's a little too starey as well. <laughs> and then the doctor, who yeah. apparently thinks it's um, letting a kid watch a horror movie is reason for putting them in a foster home. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, well, we'll put them in a foster home while you get some tests. How long are these tests? <laughs> right. I mean, like, put them away. So many of these things are kind of weird because it's like normally if a child is in the hospital, the parent doesn't leave them there. Right. You stay with your kid. You put you a still, gown on him. You don't have you right, wear you, his regular clothes. You still have to like consent to care. Like they can't just like right. give your kid injections and stuff like that. They have yeah. to talk yeah. to you about this because he's a minor. You know, like what the heck are they doing here? But again, at least to the, it, it increases that nightmarish feeling where she's trapped in a situation she can't control. Yeah. Right. Down to the security guards grabbing her and forcing her to stay in the room with the well, doctor. Well, listen, she brought it on herself in that case. You know, it was it was because she's saying Freddie did it 
and this is the whole thing, right? You're saying, why doesn't she believe the kid? But as soon as right. she said, hey, Freddie did it, people treat her like a crazy person. And, <laughs> and the kid is telling her time and time again that Rex is protecting him. Why did she not bring the damn dinosaur to the freaking <laughs> hospital? You are a bad parent. Well, then they wouldn't have the set piece of the kid walking across the freeway. That's why he was going back home. Uh, let me tell you fairly green screen by the way and i from what i understand not to not to segue too much from you it took her a hundred takes to duck underneath that truck on green screen on green wow. screen on green no less. screen it's not a real truck you're not really ducking a hundred takes well that's what makes really it was? harder right because it's not there you're like right, uh, you're what am i doing yeah, out, yeah. Uh, i mean post. it wasn't like it was common mm. technology then so i want to know does Freddie kill Robert England? Because Robert disappears never again. Halfway yeah. through the I, I movie. I want to see him. It would have been a little more cathartic to see this guy. De- but but then again, it made him who and what he was. So why would he want to get And I would have him? loved to have seen that scene if, in fact, it happened. But right. apparently, and you probably know this from the Never Sleep Again, but I read somewhere that they filmed or they were going to film Ooh, a spider. sequence, the spider sequence. The spider mm-hmm. sequence. So I can only assume that's where Robert dies. Would have yeah. would have ended up, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's it's low key except for the final sequence in Freddy's Lair, right? There's not a lot of kind of big, elaborate set pieces no. in this film. It's very low budget. It's notice it's noticeably lower budget rate right, than the other Freddy films, which sort of have really elaborate, you know, effect sequences and stuff. Right. I think it's such an interesting exercise. You know, it like my son said, it does have some rough edges. It doesn't all completely come together. But I almost oh. would have liked to seen him revisit this idea again you know yeah yeah and it's i think it's really interesting the fact that they try to explain that this freddy character has taken a life because it really has you know and yeah. when you think about horror fans and everything because you see it in the movie but it takes a life of its own like outside of the movies and that's the whole point of this during wes's monologue you know about what's really going on here like that writing a movie for this entity that's taken the form of freddie is like keeping the genie in a bottle and now that freddie's dead that's why it's it's appearing and you heather are the gatekeeper you're nancy yes. yeah mm-hmm. yeah and you yeah. being in this movie is key, you know, as the gatekeeper, because you've got to keep that genie in the bottom. Yeah. Now sign here for the next movie. Not yeah. any part of that. But from what I understand, she had a real stalker in real life. So, again, yeah. you're kind of you're really playing this. And he even mentions that even Sonny Bono had a stalker. And I had to look that up. And that's true. Sonny Bono had this guy that followed him everywhere. And Sonny Bono's probably like, don't bring me into this. Come on. You know? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> But but again, it's the levels of reality versus, you know, I'm just playing a version of myself is is really fast and loose. And it's, a, it's a pretty wild. That's and- why I really like that. I really like that scene at the end. I love that transition when she's talking to John and, he goes, and then he's like, why are you calling me John? Right. And, you know, and she's like, why are you calling me Nancy? Yeah. You know, like I'm and then he says, oh, OK, dad. Like right, she, she calls him realizes, daddy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's like wow. It's like, and he's um, just as dismissive of her as he is in the first right. movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and she, um, at that point, she should have been like, "Ah, oh, crap! I've this kid. I've been treating this kid wrong all along." Yeah, those, right. Those, well, like uh, the, when the gray streak really... appear, appears in her hair yes. after Dylan goes like full exorcist on her, and oh yeah, he pulls a Regan. Yeah, mm-hmm. and. As soon as you see that gray streak, then you're starting to question because if you're a fan, you wouldn't watch this if you weren't a fan of the franchise. Right. So you're starting to question, <laughs> is this real? Is this not real? Because it goes back to the first film, when she which gets is the funny gray because streak. I actually wrote a note like, mm-hmm. where's her gray streak? Where's the gray hair? And then I'm mm-hmm. like, well, that was the character. That was it. That was the movie. That wasn't her in real life. Right. I think it's it's such clever. A, it's, it's such an mm-hmm. interesting movie to watch. Yeah. yeah. No, it's and then you have that clever. great scene where the babysitter gets it in the hospital, which mirrors the Tina scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In the first nightmare. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I w- just wonder how they explain that away, because you never see that <laughs> how the doctor takes that. Um, right. Because the nurses, murder. 
the nurses see her body in the air. Yeah. Right? yeah. And Dylan's mm-hmm. watching this whole thing unfold. This kid is traumatized for life. This kid <laughs> right. is, is ruined. Correct me if I'm wrong. Did she stab Freddie in the eye with an eel? With a yeah. snake, right? With a. <laughs> it looks like she was holding an eel. An yeah. eel. A water an moccasin. eel to the eye. It's like, mm-hmm. okay, all right. That's no, it, it's like Tulsa Doom and Conan when he pulls it and it's an <laughs> oh, arrow. It goes into a straight arrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I picked up two. First of all, I, when when Dylan's stabbing his tongue, you get the psycho strings. Yeah. You are, you are like I said, on. no moss with this kid. No moss. He, you know, <laughs> yeah. I would have given up on him early on in this movie. But yeah, he well, also he could have he could have started in the Broadway uh, Peter Pan, the way that he was floating around in those above those cars on the freeway. Yeah, <laughs> well, again, early green screen. <laughs> I did. I did see that they um, he opted not to ask Johnny Depp to make a cameo. He apparently and then later said something to him. And he's like, yeah, I would have done that. Yeah. Like, well, I guess Johnny Depp was pretty you know, getting to be a pretty big star at that point. Yeah, and that he, was like Ed Wood era Johnny Depp. Yeah. Mm. And he felt intimidated, which is weird. Like which you're Wes Craven, you man. Gave, and you gave the kid a start. So <laughs> yeah. it's like, hey, listen, you know, throw me a bone, dude. Mm. Yeah. Um, I mentioned before that Miko uh, Hughes's dad bought that rocket ship. He still has Rex, by the way. Mm-hmm. But I read somewhere that Wes Craven was trying to get real reactions out of this kid and to actually make him cry. Hmm. And so what the parents would do, this is horrible. They would send the mom out of the room and then the dad would tell the kid that the mom is dead. What? Yeah. And if he acted well, then he was rewarded with a happy meal. As if this kid isn't messed up enough for see being a sequel in these movies. Where this kid becomes Freddy Krueger <laughs> and kills his parents. Uh, you that know, is it's... rude. That is... <laughs> Like, I mean, I think we're, you know, he we talked about this. He played Gage Creed in yeah. the original Pet Cemetery, And I think we talked about this in the concept of something else uh, we watched a few weeks ago. And I said, well, when they did the remake of Pet Cemetery, they didn't have the baby get killed. Right. They had the yeah, older the child daughter, get yeah. killed. Or the daughter. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I really even at the time when I saw Pet Cemetery, I was like, what are they telling this kid? in this movie you know because he's got to be like you know possessed right, right at yeah. the end of the movie yeah. he's supposed to be menacing and right, whatever i'll take this little knife and you cut that guy's achilles tendon <laughs> you know <laughs> it's it is kind of weird but you know you think about the way child actors were directed at this time i mean famously you wonder why they're messed up famously everyone on the et set told drew barrymore that et was real yeah all the actors, the kid, the kids to the the whole crew. Steve Keep is the Wilbur, illusion going, baby. They told her he was real because she was so little. They didn't think that she would be able to make the distinction. Process. So they just told her that it was a real alien. Maybe and they see. all kept up this fiction for her. Do you tell me it's not? <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of crazy the way you think oh. you know the way they hey, direct, they did the direct. same thing in, in supermoto so you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's not the same <laughs> don't talk about supermoto okay uh, <laughs> start, she's gonna start crying start crying <laughs> no crying no crying but uh, you know the the real brain break moment i think is at the very end when she pulls out the script and the note that wes has written on the front of the script is in the script on the last yeah. page, I'm like, when does this thing end? You know, yeah, you know, is. it just keeps going. It keeps going. Yep. Yeah. So, so right. We, we, the kids traumatized. He lives through this. And so let's, let's, let's read him the story again. But maybe he's not traumatized because he defeated the monster. That's supposed to be cathartic. That's what's cathartic in the Hansel and Gretel mm-hmm. story, right? They defeat the witch, the kids win. And they come home. He does say that. He does say that. And then they live happily. Ever. Right. They come home and okay. their father covered them with kisses. And that's what happens at the end of this. Right. His mother covers him with kisses because they're Except safe his now. father's dead. Well, mm. his father's gone. Yes. So do they have yeah. to keep in this reality? Do they have to keep making movies now to keep Freddie in the bottle? To keep because Freddie away. So this yeah. is not going to be the end the, that they have Ooh. to keep making them a new, new nightmare. Because they killed Freddy and Freddy's dead, but that didn't put yeah. put away this demon. So, you know, you brought up that that scene in the hospital where Dylan was vomiting that black slime. Mm-hmm. 
and apparently uh, it goes on like there it's actually filmed but it was cut and Wes Craven said that he has no knowledge of why it was not included but I guess his eyes turn solid red and a 3,000 flies come out of his mouth filling a room with a screeching growl mm, to make it like he's being really being possessed by this demon right, right? yeah which would have yeah. brought home the idea that this is not freddy this is a creature mm-hmm. that is just inhabiting this form um, i mean you know you talk about the going back because we were in the hospital again talking about the doctor the doctor's talking about the horror movie like that's the thing that traumatized the kid and not the fact that his yeah. father died just mm. died right yeah she dismisses yeah. that his because <laughs> right. heather tells her his father just died blah, blah, blah. Did he watch your horror movies? <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, you mean the one with the TV that was unplugged? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, he was. Were you showing him your movies? <laughs> but but we're pigeonholing little Miko here as a horror child, but he was all over the place in the early cop. to mid kindergarten cop, Apollo 13, Spawn. He was on a roll. He released two albums in 1995 what? when he was nine years old. Albums, albums, like, like like record albums, like, like record songs? albums, like songs. Yeah. Were they all about Rex? I didn't listen to them, Aww. unfortunately, but yeah. Oh, oh, direct. Speaking of Dylan, I, I don't recommend this. Turn it into a drinking game. But his name is mentioned or screamed 103 times in this movie. <laughs> so and, Wes writing that script. Let's put Dylan in there again. And Miko Hughes himself is apparently a well-adjusted adult. He is a director these days. Oh. Directed a segment of uh, Chilling Visions, Five Senses of Fear. It was his uh, latest work. An an anthology. An anthology. He did a piece of it. When this was being written, the working title was Nightmare on Elm Street 7, The Ascension. So I think it's wise that they didn't tie it in with the rest of the series because it really sits upon its own. Well, it does. It stands by itself. It's completely an animal. New Line rejected Wes's idea for this as early as Dream Warriors. I saw that. We, we talk about this being ahead talk of about his time, ahead of its time. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So he sat on this. So like, he like wanted he just... to end this series after Dream Warriors, but mm, New Line was having that. none of it. Ooh, we got no. Freddy dolls to sell. Yeah. And thanks to actual earthquakes in Los Angeles in 1994, they did not need to mock up sets of destruction. <laughs> If we wait long enough, Mother Nature will take care mm-hmm. of that. Okay. Um, critics were mostly in favor of this, but there were some that decried it. Uh, Roger Ebert liked it. Mm-hmm. He gave it three out of four stars, called it strangely intriguing. Um, Siskel, on the other hand, dismissed it as campy. So he, <laughs> he gave just, it just out of spite because Ebert liked it. <laughs> yeah. So he gave it the thumbs down. Entertainment Weekly said it was just an empty hall of mirrors. Oh, ouch. Apparently they didn't get it. No. Mm. I do find it interesting that both these movies, franchises, uh, both these movies take place outside of their normal. So like Woodboro was replaced by New York. And in this, it's not they're in L.A. where none of these movies have ever taken place. Or am I wrong? Well, they're supposed to be like in the Midwest, but they're clearly in California. In the first it's one. supposed to be. <laughs> How do you have a Hollywood producer making movies in the Midwest? That's not. I mm. I, I just assumed they were in. LA. No, no. In oh. the in the first one in Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. They're supposed to be in the Midwest. Yeah, supposed Ohio, to be like a Mid- right? Western town, but there's right. like mm. palm trees. Yeah, <laughs> maybe the... it's maybe it's Woodsboro because Woodsboro has an Elm Street. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's talk about meta. Yeah, because so, Sydney lives on Elm Street, mm-hmm. which is a famous. It was a clipped scene I, in Scream One when she's on the deaf typer trying to call nine one one. She that. enters her address and okay. she lives on Elm Street. Well, in Scream Five, watching it again, they drive, they by, drive Elm Street. by Elm Street. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you know what's interesting though, Jim? You're talking about reviews. Apparently, Janet Maslin actually liked this. <laughs> she sat through the whole thing <laughs> we've talked about her reviews before where she doesn't really normally seem to like horror movies yeah. but she um gave some fairly relatively positive uh reviews of this he, she calls this an ingenious cathartic exercise in illusion and fear i mean that's Ooh, some high praise wow that's that's yeah. some deep thinking right there janet <laughs> mm-hmm. Wes, Wes, you've been Mm -hmm. (laughs) Maslin. 
Oh my. All right. So what do we think of New Nightmare? Out of five buckets, how do we think it holds up? I'm trying to think. I think I gave the first one like four and a half, right? It's like one of my Probably. favorite movies. So and I like this one a lot, and I'm gonna say it's a four. You know, doesn't necessarily all completely come together. There's a lot of potential here that's maybe not completely played out, but I I think this is really an interesting film. I concur. Four. I will equal that. Wow. I'll give it a four. Yeah. Look at that. Cool. Wait, one more. We got a core four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, like I said before, it's before it's time. It's groundbreaking. And I think yeah. it just lays the groundwork for Scream. Yeah, I think it's very interesting watching this after we see what Scream has become. Man, well, I think ahead of his time, definitely. Like you said, like I said, if you look at the first Nightmare film, it's so different from the rest of them, right? right? And you can see that even his original concept for that film is literally so much more intellectual than what the yeah. the, the series becomes yeah. Yeah. you know and he clearly was trying to make something that was really cerebral you know but also scary and you know it's like Wes Craven was doing the original elevated horror I was talking about Scream 5 right Jim right up there with the Babadook that's right Babadook. yeah okay so what else did we do this week um, I watched a lot of Scream movies. Yeah, I guess you did. <laughs> Although, you know, this wasn't as intense homework as Creed was, apparently, because you had a lot more to get through there. Yeah, that was like I was doubling up some days. But, yeah, yeah. You know, to get through that. But this was a little easier. It was like we we're going to see the film on Saturday. So Monday we started and we watched one, two, you know, three, four or five throughout the week so that. Um, we were all ready. And here's me and my son counting knife wipes, you know, like a couple of psychos. Still is killing me. Still is killing me. <laughs> no. The other thing that we do is we try to figure out who's doing the killings at which time, mm. because we, you know, we've watched the film so many yeah. times. So we're like, is this Stu this time? Is it Billy this time? Is it this person? Is it that person? And one of the things I notice is and again, you probably have to watch the movies a lot and be really invested, is that Roger Jackson really sort of subtly changes his diction. Huh. Each film, the speech patterns actually match the actors who are ultimately the killer. So, like, you can tell in the first movie, if you're a big enough nerd, I think, when it's Billy on the phone and when it's Stu. Because Billy has a much more subtle delivery than Stu would. It's sort of the way he talks, sort of the speed of his speech, different things. Like I notice in Scream 4, you can tell when it's Charlie on the phone because the killer's talking like Rory Culkin. It's real subtle, but it's there. And I'm like, man, he's doing a lot of work to wow. <laughs> like to make this to make this really come through so that when you get to the end, it all feels logical. And just quickly going back to Scream 6, I didn't feel that because you don't get to know these killers well enough to discern their speech patterns. Right. Yeah. right? I did see on IMDb, somebody worked out, you know, spoiler alert, the trivia section of each movie on IMDb. Yep. Uh -huh. Sometimes it'll, you'll go through the trivia facts and then it'll say spoiler. Yes. So bottom. those, so then you click on that if you don't want to be, you know, if you've already seen the movie, cause it's going to spoil something. So that's where this one lies. But somebody worked out after seeing this movie, who Ghostface was of the three killers in each scene. Mm -hmm. You know, or they hypothesized it. Right. Saying, oh, well, it couldn't be Dylan McDermott because he was here. So in this case, it's Quinn. Oh, it couldn't mm. be Ethan here. In this case, it's Dylan McDermott. Dermot so, Moroni. Uh, Dur Dermot, who, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> Different actor. <laughs> different actor. <laughs> so if you're interested, go look at IMDb and somebody's broken it down for you. Who Ghostface is in every scene that he appears or mm. she appears in uh, Scream 6. You know, we, we were just mentioning uh, Roger Jackson. I forgot to point out, uh, and I think it was on the subway, somebody is dressed as Mojo Jojo, the character mm -hmm. he voices on uh, Powerpuff Girls. Yeah. So, nice little cameo <laughs> there. I'm glad they preserved the picture credits. 
The, the yes, screen movie yeah. is not over for me until I see the until picture you credits. See those, those fun yeah. little credits. Um, Jim, what did you do? So I um, ticked one more movie off my Oscar list and watched Triangle of Sadness oh, because yes. it appeared on Hulu. Wow. Yep. Was not expecting that. I was from the trailer was thinking it was just going to be some light comedy. And it is not. It goes, um, I think, even further into the ideas that the menu kind of brought forth oh. um, about, you know, the one percent and the haves and have nots and society roles and turning them around on their head. So it's an uncomfortable watch, I'll oh, have to say. Really? Hmm. It is funny. Yeah, it is, you know, very darkly funny. But um, yeah, it stuck with me for many days afterwards. So I recommend heartily. OK. Um, anybody that has Hulu will now yeah. have uh, free access to Triangle of Sadness and yeah, give it see. give it, it. It's a long, long movie. Oh, so when it started, uh, it's following two models like that are in a relationship. I'm like, is this the right movie? Did I did I pick the wrong <laughs> movie? But it is. And it gets to where it's going. Believe me. So give it a chance. OK. Yeah, I did see that it was up there now, so I'll have to check it out because we had talked about that at one point. But yeah, I said I saw the preview and I wanted to see it. Yeah, and I never got but again. It was but it's it. also one of those movies that, you know, playing down the street from you, but not here. I think it was in the theater for like a week. Right. Well, I mean, mm-hmm. we talked, you know, uh, I mentioned women talking to you guys like four yep. months ago. It's That's on the best picture streaming. list. Most people don't even know what that movie is. I know nobody's seen women talking. Yep. Yeah. So. And it's very now it's on Amazon Prime and yeah. the uh, the write up on that is very ambiguous as well. It's a tough movie, but it's good. It's worth watching. And, you know, don't make me get angry that Sarah Polly wasn't nominated for Best Director. Oh, boy. Here we go. So. <laughs> All right. Um, I was going to hold off on this, um, mm. but I'm now in episode four. Uh, and I know we, we're not real big Star Trek talkers here, but uh, Picard season three is on uh, paramount plus season one was interesting um if you're star trek next generation that was it was, came out 87 it was really big when i was in college um you know my stepfather was a huge star trek fan uh i kind of came in on the back end to me as a kid star trek was very it was too cerebral compared to like star wars but uh this season three they are bringing back all the, the legacy characters from Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, and they are leaning heavily into Star Trek II Wrath of Khan. Um, there's a lot of fun stuff going on here, and I'm really enjoying it. So, And this is the last season. So, hmm. you, you know, some, some of these actors are very long in the tooth. Poor um, Patrick Stewart. You know, I think he's pushing 70-something, but uh, I'm enjoying it. Very fun. Hmm. There you go. All right. So what are we doing next week? Oh, speaking, I think we're bringing Rex back. Rex is going to be here, our co-host. But I am not. Yeah, we're, we're one co-host down. So uh, Rex will be uh, joining us for a uh, dinosaur uh, marathon. Let me tell you, uh, when I went to go see Scream 6 yesterday at my local theater, the ticket taker was heavily selling 65 which is what we're going to be covering next week every person that came up there was one girl who apparently you know she knew the ticket taker because she's pro- she was probably the uh, the girl that was the movie patron was probably in her early 20s and it sounded like she comes on a regular basis on saturday afternoons to go see a matinee she was by herself and the guy says oh what are you going to go see today and she walked up blind she didn't know it was playing she was looked at the movie time she said oh i'll go how is scream how is, is scream sold out nope and she she bought a ticket for scream but before she picked do you want to go see adam driver fight dinosaurs and like really excited right <laughs> he's doing the hard sell doing the hard sell is he getting is he getting and he like said he didn't back? even see it he was like because i want to see it and i want to know how good it is and oh i think you you're, you're watching a budding romance uh, right before your very eyes so this she's like no, comes in every she... week he's he's watching her from afar so she says, no, I think I want to watch Scream, but maybe next week I'll watch Adam Driver fight dinosaurs. And so oh. then she goes in and then there's another couple. He says to them, do you want to watch Adam Driver fight dinosaurs? Like, to, like <laughs> He's trying to get like some real time critique or something. Yeah. So when I got there, it's like, let I, me know when I got up to the front, I'm like, I do want to see Adam Driver watch dinosaurs. <laughs> but 
next uh, week. unfortunately it's going to be next week so I, uh, one for screen please so one for screen Blame. yeah <laughs> so what are we pairing up with 65 jim since this is your choice the last dinosaur this has been like almost epic in my memory this movie because i only saw it twice as a kid and i was unable to find it or source it for years and years and years and thanks to warner archives which is a subset of warner brothers that puts out DVDRs of movies that aren't as popular in the Warner catalog. So you can buy them and they're made to order on this Warner Archives website. So I found The Last Dinosaur maybe six, seven years ago um, via Warner Archives. So I ordered it, they burned it to a DVD, and now I have it in my so you physical, have a physical collection. You have a physical yes. Collection. Yes. But Jeff, I sent it to you. You can see it on the Internet Archive. Yeah, for, I might have to watch free. it on my phone. I don't know. Yeah, uh, that, that's to too bad TV. because hopefully you can throw it up on your TV. Yeah. But yeah, this is something that I've loved as a kid and I am very much looking forward to watching it again. I've only seen it once since I've got the DVD, which was, you know, six or seven years ago. So hmm. it's an excuse for me to pull it off my shelf and watch it again. Okay. The Last Dinosaur. There you go. Yeah. Adam Driver. Mm -hmm. fighting dinosaurs okay uh you guys just you you keep dragging me into this damn horror crap and i'm starting <laughs> to like it it's growing on you like a fungus yeah, yeah well, i'm a fun guy to be with <laughs> all right well all right everybody listening. thank you thank you bye hey everybody if you like what you just heard be sure to follow tmi confessionals of the nerd kind on apple podcasts iHeartRadio, spotify or whatever you listen to your favorite podcasts on. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and then share it with your fellow movie nerd friends. It means the world to us and helps our listenership grow. You can also find us on all of the socials, Instagram and Twitter at TMI underscore podcast 2018. We're on Facebook and YouTube as well. Just look for the popcorn bucket. You can help support this show by visiting our Tee Public page for some TMI branded goodies such as hoodies, T-shirts, mugs, and stickers. tpublic.com slash TMI Confessionals, all one word. A five-star review would be incredibly nice as well. I'm just saying. Thanks again for listening. We truly appreciate you. Be sure to come back next week. We'll save some popcorn for you. Ghost face. <laughs> You're an idiot.